Okay, uh, we'll call the mean order then for the afternoon of March 1st, 2022. Honey, would we please yes, we call do. the roll? We do have members remotely, so we'll be calling roll and votes out loud. Jimenez? Present. Perales? Here. Cohen? Here. Here. Roscoe? Here. Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Mayhem? Here. Jones? Jones? Present. Present. Ricardo? Present. Present. Thank, thank you. You have a quorum. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome, Welcome back, back, everyone. everyone. Uh, uh, good, good to see, see many of us back, back in, in person, person as we mentioned. mentioned. Um, um, let's, let's please stand, stand if you're able, able and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, uh, today's invocation uh, will be provided by Trinity Tomzik with Garden to Table. And Council Member Perales, I think, will virtually tell us more. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. And today I'm happy to welcome Trinity Tomzik, who is a proud resident of District 3 uh, and the board chairperson of Garden uh, to Table Silicon Valley, which is a local nonprofit that runs a one acre educational farm here in downtown San Jose. Garden to Table strives to address food insecurity, improve health and well being, uh, and build a strong uh, community. Trinity is at uh, the farm every single day getting both kids and adults excited about growing and eating vegetables. She especially loves working with members of the community that participate in the farm's weekly harvest box program, a program that provides organic vegetables to those in need or with chronic health conditions. This program provides an opportunity for participants to harvest their own vegetables, connect with others, and learn about nutrition. It is my pleasure now to introduce Trinity from Garden to Table Silicon Valley as she gives us a tour of the Taylor Street Farm and shares about all the important work being done. programming for kids and the kids grow amazing vegetables they give those vegetable plants so much love they talk to them they water them and make sure they grow into really strong plants thank you so much for taking the time to learn about the farm we really hope that you will come to the farm to meet some neighbors get your hands dirty and go home with some amazing vegetables
All right. All right. Thank, thank you, you to, to uh, you. the team, the team and the wonderful volunteers, volunteers at Garden to Table. Uh, let's go now to ceremonial items. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco will be presenting with me a proclamation that March is Women's History Month. <laughs> and I should have mentioned, uh, and since uh, we just went to Councilmember Prowls, so we should all congratulate Councilmember Prowls on the recent yeah. addition to his family. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to ask if uh, Council Member Davis wants to join us on this <coughs> unbelievable occasion. I don't see uh, my other female colleagues, but if they walk in, open invitation. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here in person and virtually. Uh, let me start by extending a, a breath of appreciation for all the wonderful women who have so much life and value to this world. This month of March represents Women's History Month, a month to celebrate all women, including the tiniest of little ones. Congratulations to Council Member Perales again for bringing that little girl into this world. We inherit a bevy of double standards though, impossible to meet and beat, especially us working women during this ongoing pandemic. But let, rem let me remind each and every one of us that we are chingonas. My mother would have smacked me for having used that word back then, but now it is a badge of honor. <clears throat> Women's History Month began as a singular day, March 8th being International Women's Day. That was then extended to a week of women's recognition and then a month, though I want to add that every day we should be celebrating women and their contributions. To me, Women's History Month is about honoring those who came before us, the women who opened doors and set an example for the next generation of future female leaders. Their actions serve as reminders for what can be accomplished. There are many trailblazers to reference. San Jose's own female healthcare workers and our own hardworking guerreras who selflessly saved many lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Scientists like Pfizer's Dr. Katherine Jansen and Dr. Caitlin Carico, who developed the life-saving mRNA vaccine. Female politicians, like the first ever black female Vice President Kamala Harris. Senator Nancy Pelosi, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Representative Stacey Abrams, who together are closing the political gender gap while fighting for America's most marginalized. We have, including myself, myself in there, five women sitting in the 10th largest city council. Bravo. Our very presence shows that we belong in positions of power. Activists who have since passed in 21, including Martha White, who sparked bus boycotts in the segregationist South, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, who led the Dakota pipeline protests to campaign for indigenous and environmental justice, and Patricia McGinnis, noted to be the nation's first abortionist rights activist far before Roe versus Wade. Though it goes without saying that the contributions of women who don't make the books of history are perhaps the most important. I, ca I, count, <clears throat> I count my mother in that group who with a third grade education had a vision. She influenced me to lead and represent a beautiful district in ways that she didn't even realize. I'd also like to recognize the mothers of my team and your teams who encouraged their kiddos 
to have a vision, to dream. And now they support each and every one of us on the 18th floor. Or the street vendor who works hard in front of Our Lady of Guadalupe to put their kiddos through med school. Those seeds of encouragement and support bloom to create those leaders who take center stage and make a difference. Through our history, women have faced countless patriarchal barriers and restrictive stigmas. For, for too long, we were deprived of full participation in society. We must not forget that women's rights to vote was granted only a century ago, and for women of color, it was really just a few decades ago or a few decades later, I should say. It was only because of the courage of so many strong women that we have broken these glass ceilings and gained the traction we have today. In honor of today, I'd like to present this proclamation to East San Jose's own Angelica Flores. As owner of Flores Professional Services and Vice President of the Board of Directors of Latino Business Foundation Silicon Valley, Angelica has ensured that our small, woman-owned business community is well cared for. In 1999, when there was a tremendous demand for representation and assistance to local families and beneficiaries of the immigration enactment law, Angelica provided low-cost immigration assistance. Through her work, Angelica helped hundreds of families adjust their status and create lasting legacies in our city. Her perseverance for putting people in a better position continued as she encouraged and funded programs such as back to school backpacks, giving away backpacks to children in low-income communities. Later in 2004, Angelica created and funded the program Mujeres Exitosas, in which she along with a great group of volunteers were able to assist underprivileged, underprivileged women with self-improvement workshops on education, building skills, domestic violence awareness, and confidence building. The one of Angelica's highlight success stories was when her work with DACA, with DACA recipients, was recognized by local TV stations for having the very first approved DACA case in the state of California. Through her work with DACA, she was able to assist over 1,000 DACA recipients obtain DACA status at a very low or no cost to them. Angelica has always advocated for her community, for women, and for fellow small business owners. We thank you profusely for your service, and we honor you with this proclamation. Without your impact, sin su impacto, nuestra ciudad no sería lo que es el día de hoy. Felicidades, Angelica. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, and all the council members. My name is Angelica Flores. I am the owner of Flores Professional Services, and the Vice President of the Latino Business Foundation, Silicon Valley. It is an honor to receive this proclamation in the name of all women in our city. As we celebrate Women's History Month, we celebrate the significance and undeniable contributions of women in our history. We celebrate those women who have broken barriers and various fields despite the many challenges and hurdles for equal treatment and opportunity. Locally, we recognize the common obstacles women often face. We know that these obstacles increase due to the pandemic. Nonetheless, the communities, our communities, resilient as they are, have been able to pivot and move forward to adapt to the new normal. As we celebrate women who have led the way, we must acknowledge the ones that stood at the forefront of this pandemic and have used their leadership skills to help guide us and move us forward. Many of these beautiful women leaders are here today. Thank you, thank you all for your leadership. Also, as a business owner myself, I want to emphasize on the importance of the contributions of women in the field of business. 
U.S. women-owned businesses generate $1.8 trillion a year. 40% of U.S. businesses are owned by women. And in our very own East San Jose, 65% of businesses are women-owned. Today, there are 114% more women-owned businesses than there were 20 years ago. With all this in mind, we recognize that we have made progress, but there is still more work to be done, and I am very hopeful. Let's continue to support and prepare one another, and once again, it's a great honor to receive this proclamation in the name of the women in our city of San Jose. Thank you. All right, we're on to orders of the day. Uh, does anyone on the council have changes to the printed agenda? Uh, item 3.4, the booster mandate repeal, uh, needs to be added under uh, orders of the day. That requires a two-thirds uh, vote of the members of the council present. And staff is requesting one week deferral of item 2.7, which are actions related to the naming rights of the competition arena at the Ice Center of San Jose. Are there any other changes? Uh, Councilman Cohen. I guess I'll, <laughs> somebody has to make a motion for that order, right? Um, uh, they do. The orders. I wasn't gonna make the motion. I'm, I'm going to just express that I don't, I'm not, I don't see the urgency on the booster mandate repeal and I will be voting against orders of the day. I think that we ought to see how the mask mandate um, removal tomorrow affects the information in our county and that we don't have the same urgency to repeal this as we did when we put it on. So. I won't be voting against orders of the day, assuming there's a motion for it, um, if it includes that emergency item. Okay. Other comments or motion? Um, I need to go online. Tony, um, actually, Henry, are you able to see? Are there any council members with their hands raised? Okay. All right, let's. Um, I'll make the motion, Mayor. All right, there's a motion from Vice Mayor. Is there a second? second? All right, second on the orders of the day. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Cohen? No. Carrasco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Mayor, my audio is out. Okay. Uh, Councilman Esparza, were you able to hear, or is it just your audio that's out when you speak? Right. They might not be uh, hearing the council chambers at all. I interpreted correctly. Oh, boy. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Councilman Esparza, can you hear me right now? I'm taking that as a no. <laughs> yes. Did that work? All right. That did work. Okay, were you able to hear any of the discussion on this item on orders of the day? I don't know if you can hear me, but it sounds like there's a several minute delay and I can't hear you on Zoom. Councilmember Sparza, I'm texting Tony to see if there's a, a sound issue. I was late. What happens? You know, <laughs> I knew one of Can you hear me? So there's a, a long delay, and I literally said that. 
Huh. You said let me get ready.
the meeting to order. I am. Okay, I just adjusted audio on my end. Are they able to hear over there? Councilmember Sparza, could you indicate if you're able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Some people have accused me of being fuzzy anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, but you can make out the words. Can, can uh, folks on the line, Councilmember Sparza, can you make out the words? Yes, very <laughs> fuzzy though, but yes. Huh. huh. Um, <laughs> sure. Does this sound better? No, it's the same. It's the, it's same. the same. All right, so it is the Zoom. All right, that's my, the extent of my technical expertise right there. <laughs> um, the important thing is uh, she can, in fact, hear words and make those out. So I, I think we'll plow ahead fearlessly. And where we left, left our heroes, we were on orders of the day. There was a motion uh, by the vice mayor, and I think we were going to vote on orders of the day. So why don't we start over on that? And the orders of the day uh, included a new item 3.4, the booster mandate, and a deferral of item 2.7. Okay. Okay, Jimenez? Yes. Prowlers? Yes. Cohen? No. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're on to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. All right, next up is the consent calendar. Uh, we're gonna pull item 2.13, which is a memorandum of understanding with California High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, I'm going to look for other items to pull, but my screen has gone, has abandoned me. Okay, there we go. Um, are there other items that the council would like to pull from consent? I'm not seeing any virtual hands or anyone else speak. So let's go first to item 2.13, Memorandum of Understanding with the California High Speed Rail Authority. Council Member Peralta, would you like to speak on this item? to speak on this item, I'm happy to go to them first. We, okay. we, just, we did just have a hand go up. Yes, Ben Leach from Preservation Action Council. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, um, appreciate the opportunity to comment on this item. I appreciate the opportunity to comment um, on um, the fact that this is an MOU that is ostensibly supposed to address all of the knowns and unknowns facing the Deer Don Station uh, Integrated Concept Plan at this point. Um, we strongly support Council Member Perales's, uh proposed memorandum and the very modest additional language that we seek to introduce into this MOA. Um, the reason is, as you are likely aware, there's a, a, an enormous uncertainty about the fate of the historic station in the um, station planning plan. Um, the MOU, uh, was completely silent on the historic significance of the station, the historic designation of the station, and what we think is the reasonable uh, need to proactively plan for the feasibility of retaining that station in place, if in fact that is possible. Um, that is planning that needs to be done in conjunction with all of the other elements of the DISC plan, which is admittedly very um, complex, but to wait until other issues are addressed before addressing the fate of the station, uh, we fear is a recipe for its, its loss. Um, so uh, the proposed language we think is very um, reasonable. The MOU does address a number of knowns and unknowns about the plan to some level of specificity, grade crossings, uh, park encroachments, and the fact that it was silent on the station itself um, 
was frustrating and alarming and evidence that uh, it's going to take continued proactive uh, um, advocacy to raise this awareness uh, through the process. Uh, we did attach a petition that we've been circulating for a number of months. Uh, it's very popular. We suggest you read it to see that this is, in fact, an issue that the uh, public cares very much about. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you, Tony. Said in the memo, and I'm happy to hear from staff on on feedback on that. Um, we did reach out to to staff um, on determining sort of the most appropriate way to, to incorporate this, recognizing that this is an MOU. It's not um, right. It's already heard by by um, high speed rail, and so um, happy if staff wanted to just comment on that, and then I'll I'll, I'll make a motion following that. I see Jessica Zank is making her way down. This is Jessica Zank. I'm Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation. Uh, we did review the proposed by Councilmember Perales and uh, are very happy with the language proposed. So I'm, I'm happy, happy to answer any other questions, but to put that simply. Approve the stack rec recommendation uh, and including my memo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Motion a second. Uh, just a question, uh, actually, a couple of questions. So we'll go to Councilmember Jimenez first. Thank you, Jessica, since you're up here. I, I was curious if you can touch on sort of the possible sources of funding for the grade separation. As you know, especially going down Monterey Road, it's of grave concern for the residents that I represent and, and curious what your thoughts are as. Is it really still finding heaps of money floating around somewhere to yeah. help pay for that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, great a great question. question. Um, so both at the state level and the federal level, we're looking at some of the potential and new sources of money included at the federal level in the bipartisan infrastructure law. That includes a few new and growing buckets for grade safety enhancements or grade crossing safety enhancements, including full grade separation. In November, we also did apply for a federal CRISI grant. That's one of those existing programs that's been added to. We applied for that to advance the design and environmental review for those grade crossings at Branham Skyway in Chenoweth. And so we're hoping, we have not heard back about that application, but we'll continue to pursue a number of those again at the federal and the state level to move this forward. Okay, thank you very much. And, and Mayor, I'll just say very publicly, I. I hope that you, I think you have been very active in the space, but just continue to weigh in to help find that the source of funding for that. Because if that moves forward and there is no grade separation, it's really going <laughs> to quite literally d divide the neighborhoods and it's not going to be good for anyone. So. Yeah, point, point well taken, council member. And frankly, the grade separation would be a good thing, even if there is no high speed rail. So uh, appreciate your advocacy and we'll certainly continue to support it. I. Um, uh, Jessica, I, I certainly will I'll support the uh, the memorandum from Councilmember Perales and very much appreciate the intention. Um, but I wanted to sort of highlight a concern, which is we've got a very complex, challenging station uh, to design and build and fund. <laughs> uh, and my concern is if the process starts with, rather than here's how we're going to integrate seven different major transit lines in a multi-billion dollar station in a way that maximizes the ease of use for passengers uh, and the potential benefits that it could bring to the city and the vibrancy and instead start with well, well first we're going to make sure this one-story building stays in its exact location untouched and then design everything we're going to end up with a I believe very different station and very suboptimal one. Now, I don't believe that's exactly what Council Member Perales is saying. Uh, and I know, and I, I, I appreciate and support the memorandum, but I am concerned that some may take this action to believe that what it will mean is we're gonna keep a one story building in exactly the location it's in, exactly the way it looks and somehow or another design around it. Uh, do you have any view on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, great point. And that is, in fact, um, I think why the preservation action uh, 
council and others are concerned because we don't have as clear of an answer in this point in a very complex multifaceted project as, as we would like. So I think one of the things that we appreciate is that the, you know, the memorandum and the, our partners in the advocacy community are asking us to recognize things that are, are very true already today, right? This is not only a beautiful station and a jewel for the community, it is also on the National Register of Historic Places, it is a city landmark, and it does have a preservation covenant. Those are all true things today. And the process that we need to go through to figure out how to integrate and or move the station so it is part of the comprehensive whole for the area, that process is ahead of us and it requires a lot of technical expertise. So that is the you know, um, hesitancy that the public has heard with respect to the station. Everybody you know, values it um, truly. It's part of our cultural richness and past. It's a beautiful structure. The questions are how we achieve the full capacity and potential of the future station while celebrating that culture and history. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, um, then Councilmember Peralta, would you like to make a motion on this item and the remainder of the, uh, the consent items as well? I need motion ready at least I'll approve the meeting. Okay, okay does that include the seconder? Councilman okay. Davis says yes. All right, uh, let's hear public comment on the remainder of the consent agenda. Okay, and I'm taking that to mean no cards as well. Is that right? Okay. All right, let's vote. Yes. Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yeah. Aye. 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 All right, we're on a 3.1 report of the city manager, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to say a few words um, about some awards we just recently received from the Santa Clara County Healthy Cities Program. Um, this program encourages the County of Santa Clara cities and towns to pass policies that promote health and recognizes these jurisdictions for their progress through the Healthy Cities Dashboard. Released annually at the end of the calendar year, the dashboard showcases what policies and practices cities and towns have adopted to support the health of their residents. Cities and towns earn medals, bronze, silver, or gold, in each of the nine total policy categories based on how many policies or practices within those categories they've adopted that meet the criteria. In 2021, the City of San Jose earned four gold medal, medals, more than any other city in the County of Santa Clara in the following policy categories. Safe places for people of all ages and abilities, climate change mitigation, advancing racial equity in government, and housing and built environment. In addition, the City of San Jose earned one silver medal in the violence and pre prevention and response category. I'd like to acknowledge the progress we have made towards prioritizing health throughout our city programs and services. And I wanna thank uh, the following departments for your work in these policy areas and, and give you congratulations for the recognition you've earned on the Healthy Cities Dashboard. And those departments and offices include the City Manager's Office of Racial Equity, our Community Energy Department, our Department of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, our Environmental Services Department, our Housing Department, our Police Department, and our Transportation Department. So thank you all. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Are there any questions? All right, great work all around. Let's move forward then to uh, item 3.4, which is the booster mandate repeal. Uh, I guess since I wrote the memo, I'll articulate um, the recommendation. Uh, I'm urging a, an ordinance to repeal our prior ordinance uh, requiring up-to-date boosters or proof of negative test for large indoor events at city-owned facilities. There is, of course, an existing statewide policy that governs gatherings uh, for large indoor events. And the council has a choice, and I believe uh, Dolan's gonna present us with some information around some options. 
that we can default to the state standard or we can choose something different than the state standard, presumably something more stringent. Uh, and the rationale for my memorandum after talking to uh, operators uh, is a recognition that as we get further and further down uh, with many more months since boosters have been introduced, uh, the distinctions between boosters and base vaccination probably diminishes over time. Uh, but there are some unique challenges, I believe, in implementation of the booster mandate. Uh, and uh, it seems that the introduction of the mandate uh, was appropriate, certainly, as we were anticipating a significant spike in the Omicron virus, which is exactly what we got. It certainly served the purpose of encouraging more folks to get vaccinated and boosted. Uh, and uh, I am proud that we serve a city that has the highest vaccination rate of any major U.S. city. Uh, but it has served its uh, purpose, and it is uh, time for us to, uh, I believe, move on in some form or another, and then simply be vigilant for what may come next. And what may come next, of course, could be another surge, and we'll have to be vigilant and uh, follow the data and, and pivot accordingly. So, uh, Dolan, I know you have a presentation to offer some options. Take it away. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, members of the public and city staff. Dolan Beckel, Director of the Office of In Civic Innovation here. Um, actually, don't have a presentation. This will just be a verbal uh, response to your memo. So um, we developed two options for Council to consider. Um, I'll identify what the two options are and then kind of give you a brief description. So the first option is what we're calling repeal and monitor. Uh, and the second is repeal and replace. So in the first option, repeal and monitor, is really being responsive to the first point of your memo. Uh, we would repeal the booster, the city's booster mandate, and then align with the state. That means that the state's mega event mandate would govern. Uh, it would be triggered at 1,000 attendees uh, at indoor city-owned facility events. It would require proof of vaccination or a negative test. And if you're unvaccinated, you still have to wear a mask. Um, we would monitor cases and hospitalizations and return to council if the metrics indicate that additional mandates and policies uh, would be required in the future. Per the standard agreement we have the operators, they're still able to enforce stricter requirements if they want. Uh, the second is repeal and replace, and that's really responsive to your second point. And repeal and replace, we would repeal the booster mandate, but we'd basically replace it with a new mandate <laughs> which is the current mandate less the booster requirement. So for indoor events in city-owned facilities with 50 or over attendees, it would require vaccination or proof of negative test. And again, if unvaccinated, uh, then a mask must be worn. So this would essentially mean that in San Jose, events of 50 or more people in city-owned facilities would match the state's version of the mega mandate, but it'd be triggered at 50 attendees as opposed to 1,000 attendees. So there, there are pros and cons to each one. I think from the operator's perspective, the farther we get away from aligning with the state uh, mega event mandate, it increases the impact to the operators and the confusion with the public over which one they're following. Um, we know that Sharks Ice in particular has had some challenges with the booster portion, uh, given their frequent hosting of youth tournaments and games. And so this really uh, concludes uh, our response to those two points in your memo, and we're certainly ready to take any questions from council. Thank you, Dawn. It goes without saying, I, I continue to remain convinced about the efficacy and safety of boosters and, and all vaccination. I know much has been made about the quote unquote waning efficacy after four months, a study that was issued from the FDA, but a nearly 80% reduction in hospitalizations after four months is still a very, very effective vaccine uh, that is a booster. So uh, I think it's important to recognize this is not a, a belief uh, in that, that somehow or another boosters are not exactly what we need to be doing, but rather uh, a recognition that, that as time moves on uh, and we have seen a substantial decline in cases uh, that uh, we, we should take a posture that enables us to be able to safely operate um, with the prior uh, protections in place. Okay, uh, let's go to the public. There are no hands up. Okay, go to council. 
Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And um, yeah, as we always uh, acknowledge, uh, obviously this pandemic has been very fluid. Things change every day, but we are starting to see a trend in a certain direction. And again, nobody knows what's gonna happen if a new variant uh, comes out. But as far as where we are right now, I think that we should at least, you know, align ourselves with what the state is doing. It will minimize a lot of the confusion. I'm not sure, um, and Dolan, maybe you can um, give me some insight. I don't know if we've um, gotten feedback from Team San Jose or some of the other facility operators that uh, if they're having challenges as well with our Yeah, th thanks, Vice Mayor. Um, you know, the larger framing is obviously there have been challenges since day one with with the indoor facilities being down to 50 plus. Um, so for example, some of the sharks attendance, which has been up to 17,000 is now down to 5,000 uh, after the booster mandate. So there's a, definitely a cause and effect. Um, the Team San Jose has also seen fall off and has a list of of events that have moved to other locales because of both the vaccine mandate and the booster mandate but the booster mandate has also caused a fall off as well so yeah it, we we probably collaborate two or three times a week with our operators um on where we are and where we're going and so the the, the feedback definitely became much more impact there's much more impact after the booster portion of the mandate was implemented on february 4th Thank you for that. And so it, it's important for us to have some consistency. I was just in, in Napa this past weekend where they don't have a mask mandate and, you know, it was just a totally different experience, you know, being in Santa Clara County and, and being in other counties and, you know, consumers and you know, attendees to these events have options. And if they could easily just go to another county and, and go to a, 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 an event or an activity as opposed to, you know, San Jose or Santa Clara County, it puts everyone at a competitive disadvantage. So I'm going to uh, make the motion to uh, adopt um, the mayor's memo for um, the booster mandate repeal. Motion from Vice Mayor. Is there a second? Second. All right, second. Uh, Councilman Cohen. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I have some questions and some comments. Um, just, just to clarify a little bit further on the, what people are saying is the effect. Um, it was asked about, so you, you mentioned sharks. Um, you think that our theaters and others are also having an effect with the difference? They are. Talked to John LaFortune as, as early as Friday. Um, and he has said that the, um, the booster portion has shown a dramatic decrease in attendance over the vaccination portion. Okay, and I, I, I'm having a little trouble accepting the cause and effect issue on the sharks um, attendance. Um, I mean, I guess it's you know hard to know, to ever uh, separate out various causes and, and, and what is leading to attendance drop. I will say that the, the warriors in San Francisco have the booster as part of their requirement and they haven't suffered a drop off in attendance. So, you know, obviously, Back in the fall, before the boosters came in, the Sharks were a, a nearly first place team, and now they're nearly a last place team. <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate. I wish they were doing better. Um, you know, I also know in our community we have a very uh, particularly highly cautious community about attending large events. And I know people who say, even with boosters, I'm not going to go to events right now. I didn't, didn't feel comfortable during Omicron attending anything. So we had a drop off, I believe, during Omicron just due to Omicron's presence. Um, so I think that probably affected attendance at a lot of different places. Um, so it's not clear to me that we can yet draw a conclusion uh, about that. I know that there are people also who clearly will be less inclined to attend if they don't feel comfortable that there's a booster mandate and people around them are boosted. So I think there's a, there's a whole lot of different elements that will, that will come into play. My concern is, you know, I think there was urgency on the upswing during uh, the, the, the climb of Omicron when the booster became available. Um, to say we really need people to be boosted. Um, I think we, we warrants caution on the downswing <laughs> in terms of being uh, thoughtful and careful about what the effects may be. Um, I'm particularly concerned that, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, we're all excited that 
we might not be wearing masks starting tomorrow, but I'm particularly concerned about what the effect of that might be, and we don't yet know whether that will lead to an increase in cases around the county and uh, around you know, the state, which would, would potentially have more infected people uh, in large events. Um, so I think that we need to have some time to, to understand how all these things are gonna play together. I've been particularly proud of the fact <clears throat> that our city has been uh, put in place stricter rules and has done a good job and, and our city has been on the forefront of, of uh, encouraging vaccines and boosters. So I think the worst possible outcome would be to swing back in another direction and then find out in two months that with a new variant that might come on the heels of this one that we now have to go back to a, vo a booster mandate or feel that we want to. And I'm concerned about what I think would be an in uh, you know a difficult um, pivot to go through back and forth. So I do think it's important for us to, to be thoughtful about this and not be not treat it as an urgency because I think once we undo it, it would be hard to, do, to bring it back again. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts. I, I'm not, don't think I'm supportive of this, but I do wanna ask for a clarification on the motion because you, you mentioned the mayor's memo, but there were two potential options. And I don't know that the motion included which option you prefer. Al aligning with the state. Aligning with the state and, and, and at a thousand and above and nothing smaller. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, and I, I won't support that motion. I mean, I, I, I know for a fact that when I attend events, even with 200, 300 people at an indoor event, that I feel very good knowing that they've, we've been checking uh, for fully boosted uh, attendees. Uh, that makes, I think, um, us, me more comfortable. And while um, I just wanna also make sure it's clear that the, while, while we know that efficacy declines with time, there's still a significant gap in, in outcome for boosted versus unboosted individuals. And I, I had a little graphic here somewhere that I can't find right now, but that shows that even boosted after four months is still significantly reduced, reduced hospitalizations and, and, and bad outcomes. So uh, I just, I wanna make sure it's clear that, that while you know, we might be at 60% booster efficacy after four months, 60% booster efficacy is still a significant improvement over no booster. So I just wanna make sure that that's, that that's uh, on the record. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't have any disagreement with what uh, Councilmember Cohen's analysis or his science, but I do wanna emphatically point out the Sharks are only five games out of second place. Uh, so, <laughs> and with a winning record. So you can. <laughs> You can still see the sharks at the arena. All right, Councilmember Foley. This isn't about the sharks, <laughs> although go sharks. Um, so I, I just wanna get some clarification on what the state's current guidelines are. Uh, is it, it's just a thousand or more in a facility, indoor facility, can, can you clarify that for me? Uh, sure, sure, and a little bit of framing. There's been a lot of change at the state level recently. The one thing that has not changed at all has been their mega event mandate. There's one for indoors and there's one for outdoors. The outdoors is a recommendation, the indoors is a mandate. The mandate is you um, must show proof of vaccination or a negative test. Uh, to attend an event that has a thousand or more attendees. If you um, are not vaccinated, you must wear a mask. So you, so basically it's proof of vaccination or a negative test within uh, one or two days, depending on the type of test you take. Um, if you are um, not vaccinated and you bring the test, and it's a valid test, you still must wear a mask in, in, the, in the event facility anywhere indoors. So the, st thank you. So the state's mandate indoors re uh, is uh, vaccinations, but not boosters. C correct. Is that correct? Yes. And can you tell me, uh, since we're, we're really talking about large events and that could be theater events, that could be the Sharks, big concerts, that kind of thing, are a city, much smaller city to the north, what kind of requirements does that city have as far as um, it relates to indoor vaccinations? Um, San Francisco is one of the that few- That would be the city, yes. Yes, San, San, <laughs> San Francisco and San Jose um, are one of the few cities in the nation that actually have implemented any booster form. 
Um, San Francisco uh, is, um, of my understanding, is requiring it at the Chase Center, uh, and they're evaluating their conditions for removing both the vaccination and the booster part, um, as is cities like Chicago, who have recently dropped their vaccination requirement completely. Chicago's a, uh, uh, dropped their vaccination completely, not just the booster, the vaccination too. Correct. Interesting. Yeah, na nationwide, I mean, the trend is, is heading in that direction. Most of the booster mandates have been for um, uh, first responders, for healthcare situations, um, very critical uh, employees and people like that. There have been actually very few cities, not even Broadway in New York, actually implemented a booster mandate. Um, so we were kind of the first in, so to speak, along with San Francisco and no one else really followed suit. Okay. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I'm just going to throw it out there. We have done at the city in connection to the pandemic things that are more strict to the, than the state and less strict, rarely less, less strict, mostly more strict. So why now, why are we looking at something to loosen up our current guidelines to conform to the state who is less strict on this issue. I'm just wondering, Mayor, you can maybe you could provide us with some background or what, what sure. the thinking is here. Um, so first, the, you know, the, what animated the desire to implement a booster mandate when I drafted the memorandum in December uh, was that we were on the front end of an Omicron spike uh, we saw it coming because clearly it hit other parts of the country and it certainly came in January. Uh, and the idea was to see if we could do everything we could to encourage folks obviously to get boosted for, to protect themselves. And because we thought it could have some impact in reducing risk within large facilities. Now we already had a vaccination slash testing requirement in place. Um, and so that was important. Uh, so the question is not whether we abandon all requirements, but is this booster requirement specifically adding significantly more safety now that we're five, six months away from the introduction of the booster? Uh, and I think over time, uh, the marginal difference between a booster mandate and whatever might remain otherwise, that is a vaccination requirement, uh, diminishes. Um, I take Councilmember Cohen's point well that, you know, there isn't, I understand some operators may not like it, but reducing um, the threshold from 1,000 to 50 is probably not a bad idea since we know that two or 300 people in an indoor space probably going to still pose a significant risk. Um, and, um, you know, I'd certainly support doing that. But uh, the, the booster itself uh, doesn't, I'm not going to say it doesn't add more safety. Of course it does. And I'm not the expert, obviously. But I think over time, the distinctions diminish. Okay. And, and that's clearly, and I, I should have just added, it's also clearly challenging to implement. That is what we're hearing time and again, that the, the implementation has been very difficult. Well, I know, thank you. I, I know um, many organizations who rent our facilities who have 50 to 200 capacity audiences have had to cancel their events because of the booster mandate. And we know that, or the, va the vaccine mandate f to start with, but we, we also know that during Omicron, it was so virulent that people, even with the booster, were getting Omicron and spreading Omicron around. So it's, we, we know that's peaked and we're ready for the next next thing, whichever, whichever that is. So, um, but, but the conforming to the state mandate does not eliminate the ability of a uh, operator to impose any stricter guidelines if they wanted to. Is that right? Yeah, that's my understanding, but Dolan's the expert. Yeah, that's correct, uh, except for Rotary, which we have talked about before. Yes. All our other operators, our city facilities, they're um, legally, their operating agreement with, with us 
is takes precedent and so if they want to implement stricter um, mandates of any kind they can yeah okay and just to reiterate no dolan what is um what team san jose lost some business as a result of the booster is that what you're saying you suggested yeah, I, um, I can, yes, John LaFortune and I have talked and he was going through compiling a list. Uh, I have not received it, unfortunately, but I do know that they have, um, obviously the, the mandate, the, the vaccination mandate itself created some, uh, some business um, that was lost. Right. And then they said the addition of the booster uh, increased uh, from their perspective, the amount of business that they were losing going to other areas that did not have a booster mandate. Yeah, okay. I, thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate the conversation and I'd like to hear what the rest of my council colleagues have to say, have to say but I, I appreciate you bringing the idea forward, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, just have a few questions, Dolan, <laughs> given that you're the resident expert on, on this topic. Um, do, do, we, do we have any sense as to how many folks or the percentage of folks that are vaccinated actually get the booster it, just generally I, i'm not looking for specific exact numbers i'm just wondering if the majority of folks that are vaccinated are actually getting the booster and so if, if essentially it's a non-issue because a lot of the folks are already boosted up anyways is what i'm trying well, to well i answer that two ways now, obviously we're uh, over we're all about 85 percent of our total population is vaccinated uh, about 68 percent of our eligible population is boosted so there is a gap um, in a and that's San Jose, right? And that, that's in that's in Santa Clara County. Uh, there, Harvard uh, and Bloomberg partnered on a, a a panel last month that indicated there was a strong correlation between lack of vaccination and lack of boosting. That if you're not if you're not vaccinated, I mean, there that if you're not if you're resistant to vaccination, you're also resistant to boosting and testing. So that's about the only data point I have on that so far. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then the, the, the other question I had is, do you, in all the information and just what you've learned during the course of this pandemic, uh, you know, there, there was, uh, I think, mentioned by Councilmember Cohen about maybe, what if we wait until after the mask sort of mandate is eased and such, and, and curious what that would tell us. Do, do you think there's anything to, to be derived or learned from maybe waiting to see sort of what that tells us or what emerges from that? Well, that, that's certainly an option. I, I guess looking at the county and our county health officer, who's our governing health officer, um, she felt comfortable today to say they're definitely ending the, the mask mandate tomorrow, uh, that they would still encourage people at a certain health risk to mask indoors. So, um, you know, fr from that perspective, I think certainly Waiting is an option. We can see what the data shows us, but our health officer has indicated that it's safe to remove masks uh, at this as of tomorrow. And, and assuming we we would wait, how, how long do you think uh, it would take for us to get some some decent data to point in a particular direction as to the? I mean, generally speaking, there's about I think it's about a two week lag, okay. right, from the time that you take a health. A, a countermeasure right, to the time right. it shows up. Okay. All right. Um, okay. The, the, the other question I have is, you know, I, I guess what I struggle with, I appreciate all of Councilmember Cohen's points, um, but I also can see the other side of it, but I, I struggle with just the timing of it, right? M meaning, like, when is the appropriate time, <laughs> right? We, we don't know what's around the corner, and that's the challenge, but we, we certainly can't approach this pushing it out and pushing it out just indefinitely thinking that there might be something around the corner i mean we're gonna have to pull this trigger at some point and so i don't know exactly when that is or when we should do it um, and that brings me just and that's a statement but it brings me to my last question you know the memo from the mayor certainly indicates uh, you know what what he thinks is best in hearing and 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 sort of uh, his memo being guided by some of the things that he's, some of the folks he's talked to, things he's hearing. But what I'm curious about is do you have, you know, because I, I think we all look at staff as you, as you know, you're on the ground, been doing this for a while, your objective sort of, you know, because you're giving us these two policy options, option one, option two, but I, I'd like to understand your perspective 
personally, if you will, to give us your thoughts as to what you think is, is the best path here. And I know that's putting you on the spot, but, but I think it's, you know, I value your opinion. And, and so if you, if you tell us as an example, well, you know, I think it may be worth waiting till the, the, the mask mandate eases for two weeks or so, then revisit it and see where we are. That's probably the safest way to go. I'd like to know that. And, and so curious as to whether you can give, your, give us your opinion. Well, I, I guess my opinion is I think we have to make a decision and, and, and hold to it because our, our operators and the public are confused uh, by having two or three different forms of max, ma masking, vaccination, and, and booster mandates. I think our operators and their owners are frustrated. And I think if we continue to pivot back and forth, um, that, that, that there's the risk of losing an event or an operator or even a sports team <laughs> to yeah. another state while, while, while we're trying to figure that out. Um, so I th also, I, I go back to Dr. Cody and what Dr. Cody said today is, is that um, we probably will have another, we're, we're in a valley and we're in a good place. We probably will have another peak and that she's watching that very carefully and at the first sign of a peak, she's gonna take the appropriate action. So, um, you know, following the county and following the state are, are kind of what's guiding me and my faith in Dr. Cody and the fact that she set those metrics and she's reduced the, vax, the masking mandate and she never implemented a booster uh, or a specific um, other mandate makes me feel comfortable in saying that I would be comfortable with the repeal and monitor uh, and we continue to monitor very closely in coordination with the county and the state. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, one of the things that uh, I derive from what you just said is providing clarity and consistency to the operators and to the folks that attend these events. But the challenge for me is that it cuts both ways, right? So for example, we do, let's just say we definitive an approach, we're gonna do this, you know, we're, we're gonna repeal the booster mandate, but then two weeks from now, a month from now, then there's a new, <laughs> a new spike, right? Then we're going back to where we were, and that isn't providing clarity or consistency either. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a little stuck in, in between some of this, but uh, um, I, I'd certainly like to hear what my colleagues have to say, but I uh, just wanted to express those thoughts and share those questions and uh, it's not any clearer to me as to what we should do but uh. hey Councilman Menez your points are well taken I you know I can't speak for anybody else on this council but I always reserve the right to change my mind when the data indicates we should change our minds uh, we're in a pandemic and I think that means we have to be nimble um, and I understand that creates challenge and tension um, but I also recognize you know what we've seen just in recent weeks and days, you know, since the time I drafted the memorandum, gosh, I don't know, five or six days ago, the case count in the county has dropped from 550 to 350 on a rolling average. So we can't say anything about the future. We can clearly say, at least for now, uh, the surge is beyond us. And, you know, going back to the words of, of Marty Linsky, uh, you know, leadership is about disappointing people at a rate they can tolerate. And uh, we know that there's been a lot of frustration and, and disappointment for folks who are wanting to attend events and, you know, people are hosting events with people coming in from other states and so forth. And at some point we have to recognize, look, if, if the distinction here uh, is not making a huge safety impact, uh, let's just find uh, one standard rule that we can all live with um, and uh, at least be able to muddle through uh, until we learn something different. If I can just say one more thing yeah. there, it, it just, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to go to a Sharks game in a while, but I can tell you that I've been to a few concerts over the last few months, and those concerts are jam-packed. And so uh, that's the other thing that gives me pause as to whether having the booster mandate is really, in fact, impacting the ability or, or the willingness of folks to come out, because I've seen, I've seen it packed like never before. Um, and so folks are obviously, you know, willing to do what's necessary to get in there. I know that's doesn't explain some of these other events, smaller events maybe, but just wanted to express that. 
Yeah, uh, council member, all, all I can say is, you know, we have a relationship with our operators and we kind of have a win-win, you know, lose-lose relationship. So I think they've been very honest with us and it's not like it's anecdotal evidence. It's Matt Kano is probably talking to them, calling them directly uh, once a week, twice a week to indicate where we are and where we think we're going and, and get feedback. So, so all I can say is, is that's the feedback we've had directly from uh, the Sharks owner, from the SAP uh, operator, and from, from Team San Jose. And maybe I could just add a little color too. Um, you know, I know we often go to concerts as opening acts. It takes a while before you ever see the band you really want to see. What I was hearing from the Sharks was, look, they're holding a lot of people up in the testing and, and the booster checks where they're not even able to see the game until, you know, midway through the second period. Um, and so I think there's some of the frustration about that that has just taken so long to get people in through the door. I think that's at least what I'm hearing. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Okay, just to start on that last point, I'm a little confused though, because if we you go to the state rules, we would still be checking vaccination and or testing at the door at a Sharks game, right? So I, I just wanna understand this part about um, challenging to implement. Is it challenging? It, at the large venues above a thousand, we would still have to be implementing something that will delay people at the door, right? Right. You you wouldn't be testing if folks have not been boosted, only if they haven't been vaccinated. So it's fewer people who require the testing. That's right. More people who get so. Okay. I mean, there's a there's a little bit of a distinction. It's a volume issue, but, but yeah. it, it's really we're still we still will be having an implementation issue in testing, making sure everybody's got what they need. The one part that I don't <laughs> I've never understood is this idea that the unvaccinated will still have to keep a mask on. I. I have trouble believing that ever happens. The unvaccinated are the least likely to wear a mask, and once they're in the door, no one knows who they are, and no one can keep track of them. So I, I don't buy that as a safety benefit at all. <laughs> so um, yeah, point well that taken. clear. I mean, clearly that rule is is just a performative rule and not an actual rule. Um, you know, last fall we had levels drop way below where they are now, right? They 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 were still above now where they were last fall, and we all said, "Oh, good, we're out of the woods. Things are better." And then December came and we all know what happened. I don't doubt that we're gonna, we have two reasons why we'll have another surge. One is likelihood of another variant. The other is that we also know this is seasonal and winter is less likely to be high, even though this was really high in Omicron. Um, and I asked this question, I've asked this question before, but just to clarify, there's the new subvariant of Omicron out there that we've, I've read is, is more contagious and more virulent than Omicron. I know it hasn't reached our area yet, um, there's an expectation, though, that we'll probably have um, a surge here of that or of some future variant. So, so Dr. Cody's addressed that twice. I mean, she is monitoring the two subvariants. It's behaving differently outside the United States than it is here in the United States, and she's keeping her eye on that, uh, and we'll continue to monitor that. Right now, she specifically addressed that wasn't a concern uh, as part of her decision to. Uh, uh, right. to rescind the masking order um, tomorrow. Yeah, and that's sort of my next point. I'm not, I, I just wanna make sure it's clear that the decision about masking versus the decision about vaccines are somewhat two different, two somewhat different decisions. Masking has become very political. I know vaccines have two, obviously, but um, you know, there is, a, there is a clear discomfort that we all have wearing masks, and I think people would like to end it as soon as possible. It's also easier to re-implement masks, I think, than to ramp back up to a vaccination requirement. So, uh, you know, I. While yes, Dr. Cody and others are comfortable that we're in a place where we can take masks away, I don't doubt that there's some political consideration in that decision as well, and uh, not just the health one, but one example here is that the, the Dr. Cody has implemented in our county a booster requirement for firefighters, and despite the fact that we're in this new position, she hasn't yet said it's okay to remove that booster requirement for firefighters. So she does believe that there's a necessity of people who are, who are in close contact with others and who are you know, potentially could put others at risk to be boosted. So I, I just want to make, you know, I think it's important for us to um, remember that. So back to the motion, uh, you know, I do under, I do think that, and I think I said this last December, the most important thing is to continue to encourage people to be vaccinated with the two doses. And while I know that many are saying now that three doses really is fully vaccinated, getting more and more people to two doses is our, should be our primary objective. So I have less concern about saying, about this distinction between the booster mandate and the vaccination mandate. My two bigger concerns are size of venue. I think it's important that in this county, in this city, that we've taken a stand and said, look, anytime there's a room full of people with 50 or more, there's a risk of spread and we should be vigilant about that. So 
I could be convinced to support a motion that says, that, that has the second option, which is keep the 50 and above, but remove the booster. Um, and then the other, um, I, the other element to me was just sort of the emergency nature of it. And you know, I, I would have felt more comfortable with, with, a, with a traditional ordinance that gave us a little time to sort of at the same time be able to react as conditions change with mask, chain, mask wearing. Um, wasn't, I'm not convinced about the, you know, the urgency here to have to do this, take it up and say it has to be implemented immediately after the vote. Um, but most importantly for me is, is this mid -size, small to mid-sized venues that would not be included in this if we go with the full motion that's on the floor. So I guess I would ask the maker of the motion if we could go to the other option um, of vaccination not boosted but keep the venue size for now and we can reevaluate that as conditions change later. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen, and you actually make some, some really good points. I'm going to um, stay with the motion as it is, and if it goes up in flames, then we can, you can do a, <laughs> a, another motion. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, are you finished, Councilmember Cohen? Okay. Councilmember Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. I'll be brief. I think good arguments have been made on both sides of this one. I just thought I'd share why I seconded the motion and was happy to move forward. Uh, just very quickly, I mean, just, just a few points. Um, I think some have already been made. W one for me that's motivating is I'm really unclear on, I think at this point, this particular mandate doesn't have a lot of additional capacity to incentivize, incentivize further boosters. I think folks who would have been incentivized by this to get a booster would have already done so. I think to your point, getting people that first round of vaccination is the most important thing, and, and, and this doesn't prevent us from still pushing on that. Um, the harm to local businesses um, and, and sports teams and, and the rest are compel is compelling to me. And then finally, I just think there's value in having a, a more standard set of rules. I think aligning with other agencies like the county and state has value. And um, I think ultimately public health is all about public trust in government. And the more different rules we have at different venues coming from different levels of government, the more confusing and the less trust I think people have. And I think now that we're back in a valley case-wise, it's a good idea for us to do everything we can to get more aligned with higher levels of government that have, have real expertise in this area. So just wanted to summarize why I was in support of moving forward. Thank you. All right. Are there questions or comments? Okay. I think that's it. Um, while I would be happy to support this motion, I'd also be happy to support a substitute motion in reducing the threshold. Uh, just put that out there for anybody who's eager to. Okay, I'll go ahead and make a substitute motion with the, uh, <laughs> as I, with the, the case that I made before, uh, not having booster requirement, vaccination requirement with the 50 and above uh, venues. You're at second? Sorry. Okay. There's a second. Uh, all right, so we'll give this one a shot. If it doesn't work, we'll try the other one. Yeah, uh, Councilor Foley. <laughs> oh, isn't that what we already have? What's different from what is different from this? No, no. I, oh, right. I'm sorry. We passed the booster. Okay. And now I'm caught up to speed. Thank you. Okay, we're all good. <laughs> Never it's, mind. There's a lot of stuff swirling around here. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thank you. I will not be supporting this substitute motion. I think it is really important for us to maintain consistency for all the reasons that Councilmember Mahan said. We need we need to rebuild the trust with with the public and having a mis mismatch of mandates um, all over the place is is not helpful. So I'm going to be supporting the underlying motion only. Thank you. Other comments? Okay, let's vote on Councilmember. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Councilman Sparza. Thank you. Can you restate the motion, please? The substitute motion? The motion would be to um, have a vaccination requirement without booster um, at same venue sizes as the previous policy, which was all venue sizes 50 and above. So at all city, um, all city, city venues? owned venues, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just I I'm concerned about the need to be consistent. Um, we've run into this with the county and other mandates, and um, 
So can you talk a little bit more, Councilmember Cohen, about why, um, why that threshold is so different than the motion? Because that's a big difference. I'm sorry, sorry, what was the question? What, what? Can you talk about why it's so much better than aligning with, with, um, with yeah, the state? Yeah, I, mean, I guess my opinion is that we still have events like uh, indoor um, luncheons and, and, and dinner uh, things and fundraisers with two, 300 people in a room. Um, we still have um, events that are, that I think are very, um, you know, the, the, where, where spread can occur if people are not vaccinated. And I think it's important for us to say that if people are gathering in large numbers, that the people in that room are vaccinated and we're checking for that to ensure it. I, I just think once you get to abo above us, getting to a thousand is not a, some magic threshold. In fact, I would argue that in a big space like a theater where there's a lot more airspace and things, it's probably safer than in some of the places where you have 50 to 100 people in a, in a smaller room. So I actually think it's important to continue to have the vaccine mandate for venues that are smaller than a thousand. My, my concern remains the inconsistency. I think during um, during COVID, there have been a number of different events, right? Community events, big events, concerts, games. And I think it's challenging to it's confusing for folks to come out with different mandates, what the state is doing, what the county's doing, and what the city is doing. And I, I do think that, um, I think it's confusing and I think it's hard for people to, I, I, I just think that we need to keep the rules straight so that people know what's expected of them and they know what's gonna happen from city to city within our own county, um, much less the rest of the state. Thank you. All right, other comments or questions? All right, let's vote then on first on the substitute motion of Council Member Cohen. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? No. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? No. Davis? No. Esparza? No. Foley? No. Mahan? No. Jones? No. Licardo? Aye. Um, the vote does not pass with three yeses and seven noes. Okay, we'll go to the underlying motion, motion from the vice mayor. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? No. Carrasco? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Davis? Yeah, he did. Davis? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, onward. 4.1 uh, and 4.2 will be heard together. Uh, 4.1 is the independent after action report regarding the events of May 29th to June, 20, June 7th, 2020. Uh, That's the civil unrest here in San Jose. Uh, that report uh, and the police department response. 4.2 are two reports, the use of force assessment of SJPD and the 21st century policing assessment of SJPD. And we've got all the SJPD folks here. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. And as well as Siobhan Nuri. Who'd like to kick this off? Siobhan will. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, item 4.1 is an item that is on the police reform work plans. I'll just tee it up a bit before our uh, consultant, the OIR group, does its presentation. After the George Floyd demonstrations in 2020, the City Council directed uh, staff to do a number of things. One of them was to have the SJPD present and prepare an in internal preliminary after action report. And that report was um, heard at Council in October of last year. Also on that work plan, the City Council directed our office to obtain an independent consultant to look at the police responses to police action um, at that time of social unrest. Through an RFP process, the OIR group was chosen 
and they will be doing a presentation briefly followed by a response by the department. And I hope the ROIO group is up. Okay, uh, are consultants on, uh, on the line? What's that? Welcome. Well, um, it's great to see everyone, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, Community of San Jose, and City Leadership, uh, IPA. Appreciate the opportunity to present uh, this afternoon. Um, Teresa, do you have the ability to get our PowerPoint up? Yes, I'm currently viewing presentation PCs screen. If that screen has a copy of our PowerPoint, we would appreciate that up or I can share mine. All right, it's, 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 it's visible, visible. We, we can see, see the, the, the PowerPoint. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Oops. Oops. <laughs> if you if have, you have it, it, it would, it would um, um, you could share it. I'm going to stop there, the other one. I'm trying, trying to stop, stop the other one. one. The Zoom headquarters is only a few blocks away. Maybe somebody could run over there. Hooray. <laughs> All right, there we go. Now I have my prompt. So um, as, uh, as Ms. Nari said, um, we've been, we were tasked uh, last year with um, taking a look, an independent look at the um, response to protest activity uh, through uh, the dates of May 29th and June 7th in 2020. Um, that work um, uh, largely uh, consisted of the following. Um, this is sort of a, our work plan. Uh, we were to evaluate uh, independent of San Jose Police Department's performance from May 29th to June 7th, 2020 during the challenging times in responding to protest activity, um, most of which was peaceful, but some of which was violent. Um, and we appreciated the fact that um, as, as an independent uh, oversight group, we had five different projects throughout the country with regard to uh, this kind of work. And to the credit of San Jose PD, they were the only department that actually did an extensive act for action report themselves, which put us in a better position with regard to evaluation because at least the factual um, recitation of what went on had been collected and put together in an extensive document. Um, the other four assignments uh, didn't have that kind of um, work done internally. And we were appreciative of that. That gave us, they gave us a good start. Um, that being said, we did our independent evaluation. Uh, we took a look at holistically the events and circumstances and, and pr provided um, in our report um, an assessment of those circumstances. We identified um, some of the good things that were done, and there were many good things that were done by individual officers and the department as a whole, as well as identified shortcomings and deficiencies, um, not for criticism's sake, but to identify them so on a going forward basis the department might be better positioned um, um, in, um, in encountering future similar challenges. Um, we had a listening component, so we did uh, have community input and we listened to voices and perspectives that were previously unheard in a, vi a variety of different platforms, including uh, listening sessions and one-on-one -on -one conversation with individuals. We also, um, as part of our outreach, I spoke to elected officials, including the mayor and council, um, city stakeholders and other um, important pieces to, um, to identify issues and to further our, our analysis. Um, we also wanted to credit and identify changes that have already occurred. So if, you know, in our report, there will be references, continual references to the after action that the police department did um, and approval of 
of pretty much all of the uh, recommendations that the department recognized it should do on a going forward basis itself. And then finally, we did come up with a number of recommendations uh, in the report uh, that were designed to further assist, uh, further prepare uh, the police department and the city um, should uh, and when the city would encounter future similar situations, circumstances, and challenges. Next slide, please, Doug. We managed to get a, under a hundred page uh, limit. I think that was an internal limit that we had hoped to uh, achieve. And I think we ended up at 98, but um, um, so I'm not going to be um, presenting um, obviously every recommendation. I'm not gonna be going over every page this afternoon. This is really intended to be a high level presentation. Um, we are certainly available at the end of the session, I think after um, CNA does their presentation to answer any particular questions or respond, respond to comments uh, that uh, council or the mayor may have. Um, but this is really a, a high level uh, summary intended to highlight some of our, our work, some of our findings and, um, and sort of tee it up for uh, further discussion and, and questions and comments as, as council and the mayor may, be, may believe is appropriate. Next slide. Our methodology, as I indicated uh, earlier, it was uh, significant interviews with obviously the main source of the information and those who experienced um, uh, at least the activity from the police department side. So we conducted numerous interviews of command staff, supervisors within the organization to get their experiences. While uh, much of the experiences was well documented, uh, we learned that those discussions provided different insights um, because not everything that people experience is written down and documented on paper. So it was, I think, very important as part of our methodology to do that. We did have an, uh, an extensive amount of documentary and digital evidence to review uh, with the advent of body-worn cameras. Uh, we as professional reviewers are blessed and challenged at the same time with the amount of um, material that there is now to review, with re particularly with regard to body-worn cameras and uh, did so. We looked at the documentary reports, the body-worn cameras, radio communications, and other evidence that existed and documented the events of those um, eventful um, week and a half. <clears throat> As I indicated also, we did reach out to city officials and other officials, city council, the mayor, and other officials that work for the city of San Jose to gain their perspective. And each was candid and each provided uh, interesting perspectives and insights on their experience and um, offered uh, suggestions for us to consider as we continued our analysis. We also did, um, as I indicated earlier, community input that included a number of ways in which we were to garner uh, that perspective from those who were actually involved in the protest activity. And um, uh, clearly uh, that piece isn't as well documented as, as it is on the police side. Uh, because protesters don't then write reports of what happened, or they generally don't. Um, so um, it was important to um, gather and gain that information other ways. And finally, we did plug into other initiatives uh, that were um, that were um, endorsed and um, and were in play in process during the time of our review. Um, so we did um, uh, learn and talk and interface with those who were trying to gain um, community input through the reimagine process, through subsequent process. We did have an opportunity to talk with uh, those who were involved in the charter review um, efforts. And um, one thing to, to be noted is, is that uh, uh, their report came out after our report. So we weren't able to gain uh, from the recommendations made in the charter review report, but we were able to hear from them and even after we had submitted our report, I ended up uh, talking with the Charter Review Commission and they bounced ideas off of us as part of uh, their review process and their, over, and their, um, um, uh, their outreach. Next uh, slide. Uh, we'll start with the key findings. I'll just kick it off and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Teresa Magula and Julie Rulin, who are with me on the call. Um, 
and um, and you know the one of them and one of the critical findings is that uh, we found and I think um, the department acknowledged as much in their after action report that there were significant training deficiencies with regard to how to handle how to deal with crowd management how to deal with crowd control this was not unique to San Jose uh, I think in every organ every agency law enforcement agency that we have looked at um, to different degrees all of them were challenged with regard to deficits in training uh, particularly with regard to crowd control and crowd management um, that type of training is, is specialized obviously um, and is what I would call um, low frequency high risk um, so it, it you know it rarely happens that you have protesters protesting that ends up having at least some people end up getting involved in violent confrontations with the police and others um, but when you do it creates a significant risk uh, not only of liability but also significant risk of damage vandalism and injury and so um, uh, we we studied and saw that uh, while some scattered members of the police department may have gone to some crowd control training in 2016, which would have been four years prior to the incident, there was actually only one member who was involved in the actual response that uh, had that kind of training uh, with boots on the ground. So uh, there was clearly um, a deficit there with regard to training uh, relating to crowd management. The other unique thing about this is unlike a Mother's Day march or a Right to Life march or a right of choice march um, here the object of the protest was the police department itself the policing itself and uh, the, the the uniqueness of that is that the police were actually the ones providing crowd control where in fact they were the actual target of the protesting in some ways so that created some unique challenges uh, that we explain in our report we also did agree with the police department that uh, there was understaffing, uh, especially in leadership. Uh, where we um, diverge a bit is that even though we acknowledge that there was um, uh, understaffing in a larger sense with regard to the police department, um, we also believe that um, at least for the first couple of days, uh, there could have been more deployment of supervisors at the protest activity and there wasn't. And I think that question is still kind of uncertain about why, but sergeants and lieutenants who could have, um, in our view, been deployed to, uh, to assist or not. Um, there were issues with regard to operational planning, with regard to sort of a pro forma operations plan that wasn't uh, detailed and, um, and customized to the situation being faced. Um, it was unique and um, there was no advanced intelligence um, by that I mean it was unique and rather spontaneous, the protest. So um, that would present some challenges with regard to a more planned protest um, where you know a group is coming or planning an event. Here that was more spontaneous. On the other hand, we did receive information that folks that did try to indicate that they wanted to protest after George Floyd, uh, there was no real way to um, to conduit that information and that intent to uh, the police department in any um, in any uh, structured way, and then there were intelligence and communication deficiencies in, in different ways. Uh, everything from uh, the way in which um, dispersal orders were communicated to um, the protesters when the department decided it was time to disperse uh, the crowd, uh, not so much with regard to the ability to be heard but what was said to the crowd with regard to um, directions. So for example, one thing missing from the dispersal order was telling the crowd where the police department wanted the um, crowd to disperse to. Sounds like a minor thing, but if you are uh, engaged with a crowd and you want them to disperse orderly and not across a, pic not across a um, skirmish line, for example, um, you need to be clear about that. Um, we had some concerns about the way in which um, information about the protests, at least the first couple of days, were rolled out. Um, while, in Clay, while there certainly was um, some credence to some of the uh, public reporting uh, by the police that um, 
they were being faced with violent protesters and with violence and that some police department members were injured. Um, the concept of the war or siege mentality that was articulated over the airwaves in a couple um, moments of, I think, um, true passion, but perhaps um, um, could have been said in a different way. And I do think, I do think that in our view that didn't really help um, tamper down um, what was already a tense situation um, throughout the rest of the protest activity. Can go to the next slide. And I think I'll turn this over to my colleague, Teresa Magula. Thank you, Mike. So Mike was articulating some of the concerns that we found leading up to what we call the operational period, which is the days specific to the civil unrest in your city. Um, and that would be, again, the days of May 29th to June 7th. One of the things that we and the department found to be a, a, a great challenge were around command and control issues. And so when we say command and control, we're talking about both the organized decision-making at the top level, and then the way that those decisions and the mission directives flow down right to the people, the officers, the personnel who are boots on the ground um, engaging with the crowd. And we saw that there was what we've termed a leadership void. Mike already um, spoke to some of the concerns that we had not only with chronic understaffing at the leadership level, but then with some of the leadership that perhaps could have been called back um, to provide more of um, a command presence. We saw this most specifically impact what's called the span of control. And the span of control indicates the number of supervisors to actual officers that are on the ground. And we noted that that, was, that ratio was significantly challenged during this period. That meant that at times officers who were already facing kind of a training deficiency were left on the line without uh, directives and without clear mission for the particular days. And that was, of course, something that we saw in the earlier days and less so in the later days of the um, unrest in the city. We saw also that, rightly so, uh, the department relied very heavily on their special operations highly trained, very specific, um, very effective team of individuals who were out there who are typically called for these types of operations. Um, but the span of, that, of the particular days, especially the first and second days, really um, overwhelmed special operations. And so they were having to rely the department was having to rely more on these mobile field forces, patrol officers who were stepping into a role that was perhaps not quite familiar to them. Um, and special operations was then tasked with being not only doing their own missions, but being in charge somewhat of these mobile field force lines. And that quickly um, overwhelmed the special operations folks. And as we noted, there was missing a lieutenant link and What's important to note about this is that lieutenants are typically the personnel, the level that is communicating from the command post, from the incident commander to the field. And so when you're missing that particular individual, we saw that the lines were left under the direction of sergeants and sometimes under the direction of patrol personnel who really didn't have a clear understanding of what the mission was and the focus for those particular days. That led to a lot of um, confusion on the ground. We also noted, of course, and the public was very much aware that the department used a variety of less lethal force tools, um, in particular in the early days. And these were a major element of the operations in the early days. It um, understandably caused concern from members of the public and from members of, um, of the city. And we've spoken already about this inexperience um, and the deployment of less lethal was no exception. Um, so there were officers who, although they had been certified and trained years prior, perhaps had not um, engaged with the deployment of those tools in many years um, live on the ground. Another thing that challenged the situation was that there were actually policy changes, changes to the uh, types of tools that could be used 
on the ground against the crowd right during the operational period. So in real time, changes about what could and could not be used and the ability to communicate those changes out to the people, the personnel who were on the ground was certainly a challenge. This, both the inexperience and these policy changes resulted in what we're calling improvised and sometimes questionable uses of force. Our report details these extensively, um, but we did see that there were challenges with use of OC gas, of the flashbang devices, of the 42 inch riot baton, a tool which some officers uh, had not really held or used in quite some time. And in one specific deployment, we saw some concern around the use of high velocity rounds. Now, our work, as well as the work of the department's after action report was not necessarily to identify and evaluate these specific uses of force. So an after action is meant to be a higher level up. The review of these kinds of uses of force one by one is something that the department takes on in their force review process. But they can only do so in so far as the uses of force are actually reported and documented. And what we noted for not only the San Jose Police Department, but departments across the nation is that the scope of these operations really overwhelmed the normal reporting protocol. And so while it is not meant to be an excuse in any scope, um, these challenges were faced across the nation, the ability to actually document and report on each individual use of force used by every officer in the field was a tremendous challenge. We've encouraged in a number of recommendations ways that the department can remedy this um, going forward in future events. But we saw, of course, that these unique circumstances made that very challenging for the department. Mike spoke a bit about some of the communication challenges that we saw and identified in the course of our review. And communication, of course, very broad category. Um, Mike spoke to that advanced communication with organizers when it's feasible. Certainly an element of this was spontaneous, but we did speak to some organizers who stated that they attempted to coordinate with the department and with the city and were unable to um, have a coordinated response about their desire to protest. There was also, of course, this challenge with whether or not the assembled people were to be considered unlawful. And what we saw with this particular, especially days one and two of protest is that certainly there was a large element of the crowd that was peacefully expressing First Amendment rights to protest, but they were doing so alongside a very clearly violent element of individuals. And so what we have encouraged and the city has taken on is that there be very clear guidelines and definitions for when to, define, to declare an unlawful assembly in these situations. Mike spoke a bit about the need for a clearly communicated and effective dispersal order. So unlike some of the uh, cities that we evaluated, San Jose PD actually did a remarkable job of communicating a loud and clear dispersal order and did so um, many times over and over again from their uh, various department vehicles. There was no question that they did in fact attempt a dispersal order on many occasions. Unfortunately, as Mike mentioned, it didn't include information about where people were to go to disperse appropriately. It also didn't include information to alert the crowd that they might be subject to the use of less lethal munitions or subject to arrest. Um, and so what happened in this instance is that it kind of became background noise. And even as we were reviewing body-worn camera footage, you could see that people were just kind of hearing it in the background and not responding in any way. So certainly there is the need to have a coordinated effort with clear directives for the crowd. And finally, one of the things we saw over and over again in the nation, but specific to your city, was these micro communications that were happening. These were the real time engagements that were happening between officers and people in the crowd. Um, in, in San Jose, we observed a particularly um, troubling uh, video that went viral 
um, related to an officer's engagement with the crowd, um, we obviously recommend that the department, and I believe the department has already done so, evaluate and uh, discipline those kinds of engagements that are clearly inappropriate with the crowd. But there was also the balance of the individuals who were um, engaging with officers in sort of a, a more um, collaborative and, and signs of solidarity. So there were some officers that chose to kneel um, and, and did so in solidarity with the crowd. Um, again, there's that balance of whether or not those kinds of behaviors um, are advisable if uh, the department chooses to, uh, to promote those kinds of engagements with the crowd um, for their officers in future events. And so again, we have recommended that the department take a look at those kinds of micro communications with the crowd to ensure that they're in alignment um, with department policy and with mission directives. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Julie Rulin, who's gonna talk a little bit about the arrest and the curfew that happened during the course of the operational period. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Mike, and um, thanks for having us here today, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, the police department showed varying and evolving decision-making around arrest strategies across the span of the days of protest. And our report acknowledges that each tactical approach came with its own sets of pros and cons. Over the course of eight days, um, SJPD arrested 155 individuals, though our report addresses inconsistencies in the data that led to some confusion over this total number. The vast majority of those were released with a citation and a later court date rather than booked into jail. The report discusses how in the early days of protest, the department decided to let some criminal behaviors within the crowd go unchecked because of the unique crowd dynamics that Mike talked about and, and over concerns about staffing and officer safety. As the department's tactical approach shifted away from skirmish lines and into more strategic monitoring and strike teams, its arrest strategy also shifted as officers were able to make some more targeted arrests of violent or assaultive protesters. All of the arrests brought some transportation challenges that we discuss in moving individuals from the protest sites to the field jail located at the SAP Center, where those who were, had been arrested were identified, processed, and then mostly cited out. On May 29th in particular, there were delays in processing created by inaccuracies in paperwork and identification by the arresting officers. But these issues were largely cleared up on subsequent days um, as a result mainly of uh, a greater, de greater degree of supervision, which I think is a level of recognition and responsiveness that is to the department's credit to sort of on the fly recognize a deficiency and figure out how to address it. The early difficulties um, that we discuss can be addressed by one of our recommendations, and that is to develop a comprehensive policy on mass arrests that clearly lays out a plan for handling all of the necessary tasks and responsibilities that these situations demand. In terms of the booking, processing, and release functions at the field jail, those were areas that the sheriff's office personnel took charge of, and that led, did lead to some significant levels of frustration. We heard numerous complaints from people who'd been cited out at the field jail and then uh, taken by bus to the county's northern and eastern borders and released there. The, the goal there uh, from sheriff's department perspective, sheriff's office perspective, was to prevent people from congregating at the downtown command post or going right back into the protests. But the result was that some people were reportedly stranded in remote locations without a means of transportation, uh, sometimes late at night. Those decisions, as, we, as I said, were made by sheriff's personnel and they were outside of the SJPD's authority. Because the department bore the brunt of these criticisms though, we recommend that the city and the department leadership try to work with the sheriff's office to develop some clear guidance and protocols for handling uh, these kinds of releases in, in these situations in the future. If you could go to the next slide, Teresa. So one development that had a big impact on arrest strategies was imposition of the curfew beginning May 31st. This gave the police a tool to clear the streets after dark, limiting vandalism and other property destruction. 
without having to make any uh, of the kind of judgment calls Teresa was talking about, um, you know, when a particular group, you know, ha having decide when a particular group or assembly has become unlawful and should be dispersed. Cities around the state and the country grappled during this period with how to balance between protesters' First Amendment rights and the desire to protect property and maintain order. There's clearly a larger debate here about the effectiveness and constitutionality of curfew orders, as well as the disparate impact on lower income communities and on communities of color. This is an issue that should be addressed by the city in collaboration with its various communities to develop some guidelines and expectations for whether and how to roll out curfews in future protest scenarios. One issue, again, not unique to San Jose, but specific here, um, was concern about how the imposition of the curfew was communicated to the public, particularly on May 31st, where we heard the frequent criticism that the curfew was not announced with enough lead time, either for the department to effectively brief its officers about enforcement expectations, or for the city to effectively communicate with the public to give people plan, time to plan their activities and, and how they uh, were going to restructure things around the curfew uh, requirements. Again, this is an issue and it's covered in our recommendations. It's an issue that we think the city um, should work with, uh, with police department, work with its community to develop some clear guidelines and expectations for how to roll out any future curfew orders. If you wanna move on, Teresa, and then I'm gonna turn it back over, I believe, back to Mike. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, going down the home stretch here, uh, one of the things that I think Teresa and Julie both mentioned is that as the protest activity went on, uh, a couple of things happened. One is I think that a degree of violence dissipated sort of on its own. Uh, but two, I think the department got smarter and better at crowd control over the course of the period of time. Um, and that's what this slide is intended to, to uh, illustrate. Um, early days, it was the more traditional skirmish lines initially um, a place to do its best to try to prevent uh, protesters from getting onto the 101 that ended up not being very successful. Um, it kind of made sense, although it had, uh, the officers ended up becoming overrun and having to abandon that plan. Uh, but then when the officers and department decided to reinstate, try to reinstitute a skirmish line at City Hall, the reason for that skirmish line was um, less than clear. There was no uh, barrier or area that the skirmish line was intending to keep people away from. Um, it was just put together. And I think uh, what, what occurred was that it ended up becoming, the skirmish line itself ended up becoming a tar target of provocation. By that, I mean the, the presence of uh, officers lined up in riot gear with their 42 inch batons presented a target of enmity and unfortunately some violence towards the officers as a result of the mere constitution of that line. Um, as I said though, over the course of the few days, the days in which the protest activity occurred, the department did become more nimble, more agile, more smart about the ways in which to address uh, the, violent con the violent constituents who were there, yet allowing the peaceful protesters to exercise their First Amendment activity. Um, what we saw in the subsequent days were daily debriefs um, of better transfer of information from one shift to another, a more unified command and command post, and all hands on deck, which is not what happened the first couple of days of, um, of the protest activity. So the department got better um, but um, it's interesting because it was um, it was on the job learning, if you will, um, and that all goes back to our initial point about not having the training on days one or two that one would have hoped to have had, so that um, there could have been um, that training could have been brought to bear in in better strategic um, responses in those first two days, um, and and that is part of why we are pushing hard on, on the training piece. Um, <clears throat> if we could go to the next slide. 
Um, coming out of our, of our report were 32 recommendations. Some of the important ones we've already referenced in our initial discussion, we're not going to go over them. Um, we have had a chance to briefly look at the police department's response to our recommendations, and we're gratified to see that uh, we are they are largely in agreement with the thrust of the recommendations. The devils will be in the details, of course. Um, some are immediately actionable, sort of low-hanging fruit. For example, uh, the need to create a better inventory of less lethal munitions so that the department uh, knows who has what with regard to less lethal munitions, ammunition, and um, when they might be um, short. But this is all in line with tracking, better tracking of use of force. Um, if you don't know how many munitions you have out in the field, it will be difficult to corroborate how many times those munitions were actually used. Um, do we go to the next slide? Some are gonna be longer term considerations uh, primarily the engagement with the, communi the community pieces, which we recommend throughout. Uh, in fact, we think that with regard to all of these uh, changes that we endorse in our report, that there should be a public facing component to, the, to them and that the public should be engaged um, with regard to how the department intends to implement or execute the recommendations that we make. Um, I think that's important. Um, I don't want to end without saying that um, uh, during this whole process, the police department was extremely cooperative with all of our requests for information. That information was provided in a timely fashion. And more importantly, um, the chief um, made all of his personnel available to us for discussion. Um, and that piece was really important. Um, and to the degree that our our findings and recommendations provide insight. It was largely through discussions with them, discussions with the community and discussions with uh, city leadership that were really important for us to do what we were able to do in, in putting this report out. Um, so I think that at this point, um, we are going to um, end at least the beginning narrative of, uh, of our high level findings Certainly, I believe after um, CNA has concluded with their report, we will be available to answer any questions or respond to any comments uh, that um, you, Mayor, Council may have. Thank you, Thank Michael. You, Michael. Thanks, Thanks to you, you and your team, team for the presentation. I understand we're gonna go to the chief mm -hmm. uh, and then we're gonna go on to the next presentation and then we'll go back to the, right back and forth. Okay, and then uh, eventually we're gonna have public comment at the end of all this, so folks, folks are waiting. Please be patient, we will hear from you. We wanna get all the uh, presentations out there on the floor. Chief. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good, good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, Anthony Mata, police chief here, along with uh, Assistant Chief Paul Joseph, uh, Deputy Chief Al Washburn, and Lieutenant uh, Steve Donahue. We're all here uh, present on behalf of the police department. Our response to the OIR group's independent after action report regarding the events of May 29th to June 7th, 2020 are well documented in the memorandum I submitted on February 15, 2022. And I acknowledge the harm and actions, um, our actions had on our community. I'm committed uh, to improving our response in the future. Uh, since uh, the summer of 2020, uh, we have made uh, seven policy changes. Uh, approximately, we, ha we held approximately 155 mobile field force uh, classes and trainings. Uh, and we've handled approximately six significant events uh, during that time. The OIR report has 32 recommendations, which include training, policy updates for declaring and dispersing unlawful assemblies, and the use of less lethal force options. The report also discusses the use of curfews and recommendations for coordinating with other agencies, as uh, Mr. Uh, Janako uh, and his team um, discussed. Of the 32 recommendations, 28 can be implemented within the department's current budget and work plan. These are designated as green in the analysis of each recommendation and can, and can be implemented immediately and completed by year's end or sooner. The remaining four recommendations will require either coordination with other agencies 
or through the city's budget process as appropriate and in the context of the city's overall fiscal condition, as well as other citywide and departmental program needs. These four recommendations are designated as yellow in our analysis and can be implemented after further coordination as previously discussed. Our responses also align with the OIR report, which states that the lack of sufficient time and money for training on all potentially useful subjects is an oft repeated refrain throughout policing and one that we largely perceive as legitimate. Additionally, recent guidelines and reports from the California Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, POST, and the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, on crowd management intervention will also be reviewed for best practices. The department understands that crowd management is an essential component of training in order to ensure a disciplined response. I am committed to securing the highest quality training to ensure the safety of our officers and our community. The department would like to thank Michael Giannacco and his staff for the professionalism and objectivity uh, and their thorough analysis. The department is looking forward to using this report to affect policy change, implement training, and increase trust and transparency with the community. The department recommends approval of our response. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, should we go to Siobhan next? Yes. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. <laughs> <laughs> So item 4.2 on today's agenda covers two reports. These reports were both reflected on the police reforms work plan. One of them is an outside assessment of the department's use of force. This includes written policies, training, tools, tactics, reporting, supervision, and accountability. The second report is on 21st century policing principles. And just as a high level overview, President Obama during his term brought together experts in law enforcement, academics, professional associations, um, faith-based groups, social activists, and a host of other personnel to talk about policing in America. And the task force rendered a report in 2015 that contained a vast number of recommendations. We tasked the outside consultant chosen through an RFP process to look at every one of the recommendations and assess whether and to what extent SJPD had implemented those principles. And so while I appreciate that the report is very long and there are many of recommendations, it was at our direction that CNA address each and every detail in order to provide the report that we requested. And I'm going to be turning the, hopefully the slides over to the CNA Corporation and ask them to introduce themselves and their team. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Dr. Tom Kristoff. I am a senior research scientist at CNA. Uh, on behalf of myself, Dr. Chip Cauldron, who is also attending today, um, and the entire CNA team who had worked on the 21st century policing and use of force assessments for the San Jose Police Department, I wanted to express my appreciation for being able to present to you today. So as part of this presentation, I'll present the major findings from our two assessments, beginning with our assessment of SJPD's implementation of the recommendations from the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. After that, I'll provide the major findings from our assessment of SJPD's use of force policies and practices. Um, one of the points that I, I want to acknowledge, and I know Siobhan just acknowledged it as well, um, is, is the broad scope of these assessments. Uh, particularly with the assessment of the 21st century policing pillars, 
our assessments looked at a wide range of operational elements. Um, so as such, the findings and recommendations found within the reports are similarly wide ranging. Where possible in our assessments, we've attempted to group the findings and uh, group the recommendations into broader topics, priorities, and cost. And these are uh, found in the appendices of the 21st century policing report. I also wanted to take a quick moment to talk about CNA as a company. Um, while I'm not gonna go into the details of the company's formative history, I, I would like to point out our, our experience with, with conducting assessments and providing technical assistance to law enforcement agencies uh, across the country. In particular, in particular, the Center for Justice Research and Innovation has provided assistance to over 450 law enforcement agencies nationwide. We then used our experience that we've gained from, from our prior uh, engagements to conduct the assessments and to inform the assessments that I'll be discussing today. In conducting these assessments, our, our team sought to achieve several overarching goals. Um, as in all research, we sought to employ methodologically sound research tactics that are grounded in current standards. Through our review of SJPD policies and practices, we used our reports to develop actionable findings for the San Jose Police Department, as well as provide evidence-based recommendations. Furthermore, we sought to incorporate relevant stakeholder insights into the assessment process. I will now go into the findings of the, our assessment of the 21st century policing, uh, the task force, um, as well as our associated recommendations. Um, again, as, as Siobhan had uh, kind of indicated, um, I, I did want to briefly touch upon what the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing was. Uh, released in May of 2015, the Task Force's report sought to provide guidance to law enforcement agencies using the expert opinions and testimony from scholars, practitioners, and stakeholders from across the entire criminal justice field. The report contained 59 recommendations and 92 associated action items across six pillars. As you might imagine, these six pillars listed here, um, they encompass most of police operations, including tactical, operational, and social elements of law enforcement. As such, the scope and scale of our task for this assessment was large. While I'll attempt to distill the findings into this presentation, we do recommend reviewing the report in its entirety. In conducting our assessment, we employed several different methodologies, the first of which was a 21st century policing questionnaire that was completed by the San Jose Police Department as to their self-reported efforts for implementing the 21st century policing pillars. Using the results from the questionnaire as an initial guide, we then reviewed various documents, including the San Jose Police Department duty manual, trainings, and conducted interviews and focus groups with SJPD members, community representatives, and city representatives, including some members of this council. We then use the aggregated findings from these methodologies to prepare our assessment report and identify recommendations for enhanced implementation of the 21st century policing pillars. In moving to some of our main overall findings, one of the things that we saw was that SJPD has either fully implemented or made substantial progress on implementing many of the recommendations and action items of the President's Task Force report. Although there are areas where greater progress can be made, the level of implementation prior to us doing our assessment demonstrates a commitment to current standards by the department. We also note that many of our findings and recommendations are couched in the fact that San Jose Police Department operates with fewer officers per capita than other cities of similar size. We heard this fact in many of our conversations and many of our interviews with stakeholders, including community stakeholders who were aware of SJPD's staffing levels. This issue was also thoroughly discussed in the 2021 report from the city auditor. 
As another overall finding, we note that even in areas where SJPD has implemented strong policies and training, there are unrealized opportunities to measure and document the department's operation. This includes measuring the impact and effects of enforcement actions, as well as measuring community members' overall experience with SJPD members and their perceptions of the department as a whole. In several sections of our report and in this presentation, we discuss the notion that measurement is the strongest indicator that something is a priority, and we identify areas where SJPD could enhance their measurement activities. I'll now go into each of the individual six pillars of the 21st Century Policing Task Force. Uh, the first pillar looked at the importance of building trust and legitimacy for police agencies, as well as actions that agen agencies can take to improve their overall levels of community trust and positive perceptions of the police department. This is also related to theories of procedural justice, which argue that how an officer treats a community member holds greater weight on the community member's perceptions than the outcome of the interaction alone. In reviewing SJPD policies and training, we found that concepts of procedural justice are present, providing the groundwork for officers to positively engage the community. However, additional steps would allow the SJPD to ensure that the policies and training that they have implemented are having the intended effects. We therefore have several recommendations to better measure the application of policies and procedures, as well as better utilize the findings of reviews. So for instance, in several sections, we discuss the benefit of incorporating community perception surveys, which assess overall community sentiments. We also discuss police community interaction surveys, which look at the specific interactions that officers have with community members. We also discuss the benefits of having a universal review period for policies and greater community input on training. Relatedly, we talk about the utilization of the Hoffman Viamonte study, which sought to increase services and enhance the community's relationship with the police. By nearly all accounts, this project was a success, though multiple individuals we spoke with indicated there were no current plans to utilize the findings. We also noted SJPD to enhance community input on departmental operations consistent with procedural justice concepts such as voice and transparency. SJPD already appears to possess some of the tools to accomplish this. For instance, the department does a really good job of highlighting their body-worn camera program on their website. This is a practice that could then be expanded to include other important topics such as use of force or the accountability system. Additionally, we could do targeted community outreach on a rotating basis, focusing on one topic one month and then focusing on other topics the next month. In discussing individual community members' relationships with the SJPD, we consistently heard issues relating to the level of trust with the department. Although we would recommend that a representative survey design be implemented to see whether the perceptions that we heard are reflective of the population at large, the issues with trust that we did hear are consistent. In particular, we heard trust issues from the Muslim community based on anti-Muslim Facebook posts from past and current SJPD members. While SJPD took steps to amend the issue, including discipline and outreach efforts to the community, the sentiments remained with the community members that we spoke with. These issues were also found in the immigrant community who perceived SJPD to be coordinating with ICE despite strong SJPD policy prohibitions against such coordination and several public statements from city officials that SJPD does not coordinate with ICE. Many community members that we spoke with were not aware of these efforts or these positions, which indicates a potential opportunity for SJPD to make their efforts better known. The SJPD has also taken several efforts to build trust and legitimacy that are consistent with 21st century policing ideals, um, including the acknowledgement of the history of policing to police recruits during recruit training, 
SJPD also has liaison officers to the LGBTQ community and the Vietnamese communities, and they have uh, strong diverse recruitment uh, efforts. Pillar one also discusses the importance of building trust and legitimacy from within the department, and this is sometimes referred to as organizational justice. Here too, we see these theories being present, but these are also areas where SJPD approaches could be enhanced. For instance, SJPD members are only able to presently uh, provide training on, or provide input on training in a reactive manner through the after the fact uh, training evaluations, as opposed to providing input during the development of the training. One positive recent example, however, is the development of the officer advisory board, which allows street level members to have input on the direction of the department. As part of our report, we provide recommendations for further enhancing employee input, including through organizational surveys and other mechanisms for gathering input on policy, training, and operations. Pillar two of the President's Task Force relates to policy and oversight. However, there are several areas that overlap with Pillar one. As such, we reiterate many of our findings with, from Pillar 1 as it relates to the need for stronger outcome measurements. Also similar to the findings of Pillar 1 are SJPD's efforts for collaborative policing, including the community liaisons, as well as crime prevention specialists who hold regular meetings with community members and provide area-level crime and enforcement statistics. Also part of pillar two is civilian oversight, which we discuss in the context of the independent police auditor whose office has recently had their authority expanded as part of a pilot program. We have not been to review any findings related to the pilot program, which we anticipate will be done by the city. Pillar two also discusses non-punitive reviews of critical incidents. Um, this is accomplished by the Officer Involved Incident Training Review Panel. The, the panel is tasked with identifying policy, training, equipment, and personnel implications for critical incidents, which might be an officer involved shooting. Um, however, there are areas for improvement with this uh, panel with respect to the documentation and follow up procedures related to the panel's findings. We also discuss street interactions as it relates to Pillar 2. One of the things we note in our report is that SJPD has several policies prohibiting profiling and discrimination. However, we cannot assess whether these prohibitions were actually being experienced by community members. And this is one area where a community-wide survey or an interaction survey would provide more insight. Additionally, there are areas in SJPD policy where more concrete language could be used including in policies related to consent searches, officers identifying themselves during interactions and at the start of the interactions, and conducting transgender searches incident to arrests. Also related to this pillar are issues related to use of force and mass demonstrations, but I will discuss those further when I uh, go into the use of force presentation. Pillar three focuses on technology and social media. As part of this pillar, we discuss the wide range of technology that SJPD possesses, including technology related to audio, video, and evidence technologies, among others. We also note that the SJPD duty manual has procedures and safeguards for each of these technologies. However, we did find that community input on departmental technologies could be enhanced, including in determining whether there is a need for the technology, the development of policies and training, uh, the pilot testing of technology, as well as the ongoing assessment. As it relates to technology auditing, we also highlighted the need for SJPD to incorporate a robust body-worn camera auditing system, including random review, uh, random video reviews by supervisors. SJPD currently is in the process of incorporating an audit review system, but this system was not finalized by the time of our report. 
Pillar three also focuses on social media, which we evaluate in the context of the agency's use as well as officer's use. For the agency use, we found that the department uses a wide variety of social media accounts and that they use these accounts for recruitment, disseminating information, as well as receiving information from community members. Uh, these social media uh, accounts include Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Nextdoor, and Instagram. However, we did find that the media relations unit is oftentimes reactive due to resource constraint constraints rather than being proactive in giving out information. Officer social media is also controlled through the department. The officer social media is also controlled through departmental policies and these department these departmental policies have been recently updated as a result of the Facebook post that I discussed earlier. Moving on to pillar four. Um, pillar four focuses on community policing and crime reduction. Um, as I noted before, many of the findings and recommendations of our report relate to measuring and documenting the department's current efforts. Um, and so as one positive example of this, uh, we note that SJPD incorporates community policing as part of their annual performance evaluations for officers. This demonstrates, again, a commitment to what you measure matters and indicating that officers' community policing matters to the department because it's measured as part of that evaluation. Another example of this is uh, the effort that went into the Hoffman Viamonte study, though again, these efforts must be followed up on. On a broader scale, the SJPD does not currently have a comprehensive written community policing strategic plan. We recommend that SJPD develop one, as well as corresponding area-specific strategic plans. This will allow for a broader approach, as well as integrating the specific input and desires of unique city areas. However, this will also require resources, including adequate staffing to develop and implement the plan. Although the SJPD doesn't possess a comprehensive strategic plan, we do note that there are several community engagement efforts from the department, and I've listed a couple on this slide. I'm not gonna describe each one of these community engagement efforts. However, the combined effect indicates that the department is willing to engage with the San Jose community and should be recognized as such. We also found instances of focused collaboration in SJPD's community engagement efforts. These include attempts to engage with faith leaders as part of community meetings, as well as incorporating the faith leaders input into the development and delivery of training. Um, SJPD also has an appreciable mental health response approach, including a uh, functioning co-responder model. Finally, SJPD has several youth initiatives and youth, pol youth positive policies. While the relationship with San Jose area schools has recently been impacted, we recommend the SJPD and the community strengthen this important relationship. Each of these focused collaborations are positive, though again, require ongoing attention and measurement of impacts. With pillar five, the focus is on training and education, and it's in this pillar that we find several recommendations and several action items that have either been fully implemented or nearly fully implemented. These include recommendations and action items related to the SJPD training facility, the training curricula, and the FTO program. As noted in prior slides, however, the training approach by SJPD could be enhanced through greater community involvement. While there has been training influenced by the focus collaboration that I spoke about before, the broader community doesn't have that equal opportunity for input. Furthermore, there exist opportunities for greater evaluation of street level application of training, including through the community surveys and other measurements that I'd spoken about before. Pillar six looks at issues of officer wellness and safety. Um, in this pillar, we also find several positive approaches to wellness and safety, including physical wellness, as well as mental wellness. 
For instance, the SJPD has the Crisis Management Unit, the Critical Incident Stress Debriefings, and Stress Management Resources for dispatchers as well. The department also employs preventative measures, including an EIS system that is currently being enhanced, and EIS stands for Early Intervention System. Finally, we found that there are overall positive views within SJPD of the department culture, indicating that there is an overall successful approach to officer mental, uh, mental health. As it relates to wellness, though, we did hear consistent themes from officers regarding burnout as a result of the current staffing issues. This was most salient for officers and supervisors who indicated that there was an overall positive perception of the department, but that these issues with burnout remain an important consideration in their minds. Staffing issues also impacted the potential for proactive supervisor oversight, leaving less opportunity for supervisors to check in on the well being of officers under their control. Additional steps could also be taken as it relates to dispatcher wellness who we found were not always able to join the critical incident stress debriefings with the officers. Across all six of the 21st century policing pillars, we found that 85% of the recommendations had either been fully or partially implemented, with nearly 30% having been fully implemented. In only 5.6% of the recommendations did we find that the department had not performed any level of implementation. Additionally, as it relates to those recommendations, the 9.3% of recommendations that were not assessed, those held responsibilities for the federal government and we could not assess them. Therefore, when only discussing the recommendations that we could assess SJPD on, it, it would be greater than, than the 85% either fully or partially implemented. In conclusion, for, for this presentation, um, and then I'll move on to the use of force presentation, um, we see evidence of SJPD incorporating current national standards in both policies and training, though there are areas where these can be improved. However, where the greatest improvement could occur is through better measurement and documentation, which would, which would provide an empirical basis for departmental decisions and allow SJPD to act as an example of a learning organization. This would also allow SJPD to measure the impact of their current community engagement efforts and determine where alternative measures should be employed as part of a broader community engagement strategic plan. I'll now discuss the use of force report. And for this assessment, the methodology that we used was largely the same as the methodologies with the 21st century policing report um, in terms of the documents that we relied on, in terms of the persons that we spoke with. However, for this assessment, we also collected quantitative data and performed statistical analyses. In terms of policy, and, and, and SJPD's overall use of force, we find several positives related to policy and procedure. For instance, SJPD employs force tools and force options that are consistent with other similarly sized agencies. We also find consistent policy elements across those tools and options, including the prohibitions on the particular use of force, first aid requirements, supervisor responsibilities when responding to a use of force, as well as review processes. We also note that these elements are reinforced through comprehensive training. However, we also identified several gaps in SJPD use of force practices, some of which deal with critical definitions. For instance, although the reasonableness of force is often determined by a subject's level of resistance, the duty manual does not adequately define those levels of resistance. Additionally, the SJPD may choose to go beyond the constitutional minimum standards and identify minimum levels of resistance needed for officers to employ certain force tools. One area for improvement is the definition of force itself. Presently, the SJPD's definition of force is self-referential, defining it largely as force found within the duty manual. However, this does not actually establish an underlying concept of force 
or defining characteristics of force. Other gaps relate to de-escalation. For instance, there is presently no affirmative duty to attempt de-escalation during an encounter, and one area of the duty manual incorrectly identifies force as a de-escalation tool. However, to the credit of SJPD, they've recently delivered a comprehensive six-hour de-escalation training, including lecture and scenario modules. We found this training to be well-developed and consistent with current standards of de-escalation. Another gap that we did find is that SJPD does not currently have a force auditing component for their operations. While the training review panel for officer-involved incidents takes a non-punitive look at critical incidents, for instance, an officer-involved shooting, there is no corresponding entity for other uses of force that are less severe but more common. We also identified areas in policy that could benefit from additional clarity. For instance, we found that lower levels of force required an injury or a complaint of pain to be considered force. Therefore, the same actions by two different officers may or may not be considered force depending on whether the subject was injured. It therefore does not depend on the actions of the officer or the intent of the officer to physically coerce a community member. As force is a constitutional issue, it's not defined by the existence of an injury. Additionally, we found some areas of incomplete or inconsistent categorization of force. For instance, it wasn't, it wasn't clear which force category, options like takedowns, strikes or kicks, or the use of improvised tools, which categories those would fall under. Furthermore, in our report, we commented on the fact that a strike to the head with an impact weapon requires deadly force justification. However, it's only reviewed as a category three use of force. Finally, we noted that the policy could benefit from additional clarity as it relates to mass demonstrations, including callouts, coordination with crowd members, and post-event debriefings. However, we also know that this may simply be a matter of memorializing what SJPD already does in practice. In terms of community members' experiences, we found that different segments of the community reported different perspectives different perspectives of and experiences with force. For instance, Black and Hispanic community members indicated greater experience with use of force compared with Asian and Muslim groups, a view that is also consistent in our quantitative findings. Additionally, some members that we spoke with indicated that friends and family members of officer-involved shooting victims were not treated with respect and dignity. Community members also discussed concerns with SJPD uses of force during the 2020 protests, stating their belief that SJPD members responded to protests differently based on the topic or political tone, including with the use of force. We also note that each of the community perceptions that we discussed in this report contributed to the overall relationship, which I discussed in, our, in my assessment of the 21st century policing. Out to the use of force data. In reviewing the use of force data, we also evaluated the reporting template that SJPD members use to document their use of force. The template itself allows for detailed analysis of the data at the event, officer, force type, injury, and community member levels. This is consistent with best practices for data analysis and allows SJPD to comprehensively review their use of force. We also found related to this that the SJPD has released a use of force documentation guide, which aids in completing the template. However, the system used to collect and store the data is outdated. For instance, officers are required to manually enter information on multiple forms, which creates data inconsistencies. As such, we've recommended that the SJD purchase an updated system. I'll now turn to the findings of our quantitative analysis. Uh, using data between February of, 2000, of 2017 and February of 2021, we looked at use of force by the number of events, the number of reports, the number of community members, and the number of SJPD officers. As seen in the figure on the right of the screen, force averages per month began decreasing in 2019 and on into 2021. 
For instance, there were 51.8 use of force events per month in 2019. This number dropped to 41.8 reports uh, events per month in 2020, coinciding with the onset of COVID and the 2020 protests. On this slide, these two charts indicate the initial reason for contact before a force event and the officer's description of the subject's resistance levels. In 78% of force events, the officer was responding to a crime report or call for service. Additionally, in 65% of force events, the officers indicated that the community members were actively resisting, which is by far the, great, the highest proportion of resistance compared with other categories of resistance. On this slide, the figures indicate the types of weapons that community members were reported to have, as well as certain behaviors that the community members were reported to be exhibiting. One thing to note on this slide is that when an officer indicates that a subject has a weapon, they most often mark that the type of weapon was unknown. This makes it difficult to interpret the data and may potentially indicate a need for additional training for reporting and for supervisor review. We also note that the data demonstrate that when using force on a community member, there is more often than not some type of reported impairment, and this is most often through alcohol or drug impairment. The figures in this slide look at the breakdown of force by racial category. One thing to note on this slide is that the overall trend line for force is decreasing. In terms of comparative analysis, we note that Hispanic and Black community members experience higher level of force relative to the overall population. This is a common statistic discussed within the community. However, I also want to show that when looking at force compared to arrest, which is the better comparison, there is far greater parity and the relative differences disappear. Although this finding may have implication for disparities in patrol, they do not demonstrate any disparities in the use of force. We also looked at the impact of COVID-19 and the social justice movement on the number of calls for service, arrests, and use of force. On this slide, the figures demonstrate that around March of 2020, which is where we considered the breakpoint for COVID and for so the social justice movement, um, both the number of calls for service and the number of arrests demonstrated marked and significant decreases. However, when looking at use of force, while there does appear to be a slight decrease, it did not reach any levels of significance. Finally, we conducted a matched analysis of demographic groups using a process called propensity score matching. Propensity score matching is a quasi-experimental design which compares incidents that are otherwise extremely similar except for the variable of interest, in this case, the race, the race of the community member. We grouped white community members with uh, individuals of color based on several different characteristics, ensuring that the groupings were as equal as possible with the only difference being the race of the community member. We then use these groupings to do the matched analysis of six outcomes, which include the number of force activities used against a person in a force event, the most severe force type used in the event, whether a weapon was discharged, whether the community member was injured, the number of different injuries sustained by the community member, and the most severe injury sustained by the community member. I'll now go through the results for each of the matched pairings. In comparing Black San Jose community members and the matched white groups, the regression analyses on the six use of force outcomes found no significant differences between the two groups. While there is a small difference found in the number of force activities used with the 1.70 for the black group and 1.56 for the matched white group, this difference was not found to be statistically significant. In comparing Asian community members with the matched white group, we again found no statistically significant difference between the two groups. Particularly for these matchings, the outcomes were nearly identical. However, for Hispanic community members, 
when we compare them to the matched white group, we do find differences in two of the six use of force outcomes. For instance, Hispanic community members experience 1.65 uses of force per event, whereas white community members experience 1.56, which was significant at the 0 0.05 level. Additionally, Hispanic community members experience more sig significantly more severe uses of force compared with white community members. We do note that while these differences may not visually be stark, the differences are statistically significant and warrant attention. In conclusion for this report, we note that there are several positive elements of SJPD use of force. However, there do remain areas for improvement. For instance, policy could be improved in areas related to definition, clarity, and breadth. We do find overall positive training efforts, including de-escalation training. However, there is a lack of auditing functions to ensure that the on-the-street behaviors are reflective of such positive training. As for the use of force data, we found that the reporting template allows for detailed data analysis, though the reporting system itself is outdated and should be upgraded. As for graphics, there was relative parity between force and arrests. Furthermore, when conducting the matched analyses, we found overall consistency between white community members and other demographics, with a notable exception being for Hispanic community members who experienced significantly more uses of force per event, as well as more severe uses of force. We also note that COVID and the 2020 protests impacted both the number of calls for service and arrests, though not for the use of force. I appreciate the opportunity to present our report and I am willing to take any questions or comments as, as they may need to be. And thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. All right, response now from uh, Chief. Sure, thank you, Mayor. The department's response to the CNA's use of force and 21st century policing report are well documented in the memorandum submitted on February 15, 2022. The CNA report has 51 recommendations for the use of force report and 137 recommendations for the 21st century policing report, totaling 188 recommendations. Some of these recommendations discussed in the presentation today are also part of the city's police reform work plan. The department provided input on its recommendations uh, for these recommendations, and it is unclear uh, if the input that was used to update or correct uh, the recommendations. To put this into perspective, some law enforcement agencies that are required by the U.S. Department of Justice through a federal court mandate, also known as a consent decree, have a similar number of recommendations or tasks which require millions of dollars in funding and take between five to 10 years to complete. We are not those agencies. The San Jose Police Department has consistently self-assessed its policies, procedures, and programs to improve these processes, and it is dedicated to provide the best possible police services. As such, we have looked at these recommendations considering staffing limitations, budget constraints, workload capacity, the meet and confer process, cross-agency collaboration, outside entity responsibility, and interconnectivity. The 188 recommendations were divided into four categories. The first category, which is the color green, is implementation. These are recommendations that the department can begin implementing immediately within its current budget and work plan. The second category, which is colored blue, is continuation of existing implementation efforts. These are recommendations that the department is currently implementing and will continue implementing. The third category is highlighted as yellow, potential items for future implementation. These items require additional analysis by the department in areas such as policy or operational implications, interconnectivity, context within national best practices, implementation strategies, staffing necessities, or workload and budget implica implications. 
And the fourth category, colored in orange, are items that require collaboration with outside agencies. These items require cooperation from outside entities, simply put. Of the 188 recommendations, 52 are green, 23 are blue, 102 are yellow, and 11 are orange. These all can be found on pages 7 through 16 of our response. The department recognizes that community engagement is one of the most fundamental factors in effective policing. As such, I have made it a priority since becoming police chief and will prioritize the development of a comprehensive community engagement, community policing plan consistent with, re with the recommendations in this report and the national best practices. This will require a request for information and a subsequent request for proposal for a community engagement consultant to assist the department in developing its community engagement plan. The department will return to the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee in the fall of 2022 to provide an update and any additional analysis on these 188 recommendations. Additionally, it is anticipated that recommendations from the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Group will be presented in April of 2022. These recommendations will also be reviewed and included or consolidated as necessary in the fall committee report. The department would like to thank the CNA Corporation for these reports, and we look forward to using them to affect policy change, implement training, and increase trust and transparency with the community. The department recommends approval of these responses, of this response. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Siobhan, did you want to respond? Um, no, I, I, we we were directed to, to hire outside consultants, and I think their reports are pretty comprehensive and detailed, and they speak for themselves. Okay, thank you, Sean. All right, um, now we will go to the public for public comment, and then we'll come back to council for discussion. We have call in user three. Call in user three, press star six to unmute. Okay, we're gonna move on to Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this item and this report and, and making the process open and public. Uh, thank you for the words that were stated that uh, there's a need of a uh, better accountability that's needed and transparency by uh, the police department. Um, I've been talking for eight years now about the importance of uh, what being accountable and more open with technology can be for the future of a community. And um, he mentioned the ideals basically of the ACLU, how the SAPD can get more involved. And I, I think it would uh, really help uh, organize, you know, what, what your seems to be missing at this time. And um, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's some ill will towards, towards the uh, ACLU open uh, technology ideas. Perhaps they, people feel it's a bit too Republican and not enough Democrat party, but it's been incredibly vetted by Democratic party ideals and concepts of, of civil protection. The importance of a future based on civil protection ideals is vital to our future. It is how to develop a full community process and an engagement by the community. I mean, it, it, this work is, is an amazing set of principles that uh, we're just a bit apprehensive about in San Jose that your own San Jose Sunshine Ordinance helped develop you know, way back when. It, it's the purpose to rely on your own ideals towards the future of civil protections and more community involvement. It's a shared process for a future. It's not a future of government dictates. And that's an interesting concept. We should all be trying to learn how to develop better. Um, good luck with um, the Obama DOJ ideas that were ideas that were initially there just so we can learn to, how to be more progressive about. Thank you. Stopped by SJPD. Please unmute. 
uh, must be an election year, not a single memo. Uh, receiving the report without taking any action allows the police to police themselves. Where is the accountability? What's happened to Captain Warzone, who made all the initial calls, including the call that led to the ridiculous curfew? You cannot ask people who were injured and traumatized, some permanently, to feel that you or the police have their best interests in mind when you choose this path. This path just turns up the heat on a fire that's been smoldering a long time and simmering since the Floyd protests. The chief mentions transparency and public outreach, and yet his report was the only one the public couldn't view when he was talking. Lastly, one of the largest groups in San Jose are the unhoused, and I'm curious if they were included in the Obama report. And the unhoused are the people who are targeted the most by SJPD, and yet the chief has never reached out to any of the advocates for a meeting, and I challenge him to do so. Everyone knows my voice. Everyone knows who I am. Jason Wellman. Thank you for the time. Um, calling as just a citizen of San Jose, and I noticed a consistent thing throughout both the reports uh, was that there was a concern about staffing levels for San Jose Police Department and how that's led to burnouts of the officers and uh, issues from that. I just would like the council, if they can, consider that as they continue on with uh, forcing, looks like uh, over 200 officers probably out from their vaccine mandate. and. Just wanted your consideration on that. That is all. Catherine Hedges. Hi, um, I agree with everything the speaker for the unhoused community said. Um, the way the police treat the unhoused community is absolutely horrendous. And I know that it's pretty much at the direction of city council because everyone's so embarrassed about the quote unquote homeless problem. In case nobody present is raising their hand. So council member Perales. Um, Mayor and to all the presenters um, and uh, city staff, uh, I know obviously a lot of work went into this and uh, it's been a lot to, to digest. I will say um, as a, obviously as a personal perspective that I have being not only currently a reserve officer, but uh, also a, a, a former full-time officer here in, in San Jose, uh, being able to, to see this type of in-depth analysis on how we can uh, take a, a look internally, um, not only with the after action report, um, but just an in-depth look at our policies and procedures, um, and then the statistics on some of the outcomes, and then be able to come forward with uh, a really robust package of recommendations uh, and, and doing so here as we have with external agencies. So having some outside eyes um, and then have that review by our um, city staff and namely our police chief and police department. Um, I think it's, it, it, is, it is really reflective of what uh, I had you know, certainly believed and known all along um, that we value um, being able to con continue to improve and adapt within our police department here in San Jose. I think that's been reflective over the years. I know that I experienced it myself, um, starting with the, the police department uh, back in uh, 2007. And, um, and, and from that point on and, and, and learning and seeing as policies were changing, uh, reporting was changing um, and, uh, and certainly seeing that uh, in real time then and then now in real time now from a different perspective, uh, it's been it's been really, um, I think, rewarding to, to, to see where our department is going. And um, we have a, a, a lot of opportunity here, as we've seen through the recommendations. We also have a lot, I think, to be proud of, considering all the work that we had done in the past. Uh, and I think that was reflected within the, the reports as well. Um, I know, Chief, you, you presented your, your memos. Um, I think we heard it from the community uh, member that spoke and said there was obviously there weren't any slides there from from your part. I, but I know the the members are the memos are attached. Uh, but in a in a summary there, based on what you were stating, um, if if we're looking at this like we do traditionally our our city audit, um, it doesn't look like there's anything correct in the list that um, you are in opposition to. Is, is that is that a correct assessment that it looks like everything that was coming forward these recommendations? Um, 
have been been uh, either already being implemented or going to be implemented, but accepted by uh, by you and the department. Mr. Councilmember, uh, <clears throat> that is uh, an accurate statement. Um, and again, that's why we uh, label them uh, in those uh, color categories, because some of those uh, items will recover, uh, will necessitate um, you know, staffing uh, budget uh, and, and other things that we need to look at. Okay, thank you. I, I think that is uh, remarkable. I know we don't we don't see that all the time, even with our own um, internal audits, um, where um, at times there's some contention on on the uh, you know the recommendations coming forward. We always have challenges with the reality and timing of implementation, especially when it comes to funding. Uh, we know that is the case, but that's up to to this council, right? And future councils to ensure that the budget is there to be able to implement changes that are necessary and um, I, I know I'll, I'll say very clearly here for one, for instance, on the training um, for being able to handle um, incidents like what we experienced um, almost two years ago. Uh, I think, you know, that is, is a, a necessity, something that we saw play out in real time, something we learned from immediately after a few days and adapted in real time. Uh, but ultimately, um, as with all levels of training, Right, uh, they diminish, and um, if we're not keeping up to date on those levels of training, um, you know, ten years from now, fifteen years from now, um, the, the next time an incident like this occurs, um, then uh, we could be once again finding ourselves unprepared and 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 learning on the fly, which is not going to benefit us or our community. Um, so that's something that uh, I know um, I, I would support, and obviously we have our budget process coming up and an opportunity to see how we can. Um, fund the, the adequate and the correct training for officers. This is training that, again, I'm personally um, aware of because I still uh, have to do that and maintain all levels of, of post training uh, as a reserve officer. So I get to experience these um, personally myself and, and go through what our, our officers are going through. Um, and fortunately, as a, as a reserve, uh, right, we're not out there every single day, but in times of need, uh, even reserves are called upon and, uh, and and need to be up to date on on how we should be interacting with our community, what the, the, the best practices are and trainings are. Um, and I would say that this is something certainly that, um, you know, that, that we, we can utilize. I know from uh, personal conversations with officers that were out there in the field, um, right, that the chaos that they felt. And again, you feel less prepared and more chaotic um, if you are, are not um, adequately trained in situations like this, um, and you're having to respond to yourself on the fly, um, and and you, you know that, that turns into we know just that, you know uh, the physicality of, of human beings, right, and our capabilities and the tunnel vision you get, and right, and and, and all of that, that plays into it. But if you're if you're well trained, well prepared, um, you can be calm in certain situations that that traditionally uh, you wouldn't be, right, or or uh, an average person may not be. Um, and, and this certainly was one of those incidents that I think, um, you know, that, that level of training would have gone a long way uh, from everybody from right from the top to the bottom. And it, it, it's, um, I think it was, was helpful, eye-opening, um, challenging, right, as well to, to read over the report to kind of see where some of those deficiencies were. Uh, always easy to look back after the fact and say, wow, yeah, we should, we should have, um, you know, done that better. I think uh, we were trying to adapt in real time, as, as my colleagues know. Uh, we were even having contentious discussions on the council, right? Immediately there, are one of them being the, the use of the curfew and the tactics of the skirmish lines. All of those things were, were kind of going back and forth. But in, in real time, when it's happening, um, you don't have that opportunity to engage the community, engage the council. Uh, it, it, it's decisions that are being made on the line, out in the field. And, um, and so how, how well trained our um, police officers are and all the way down to, right to your patrol officers that the bulk of our department is really where it's going to make i think the, the biggest difference and so uh, appreciate that uh list of, of recommendations and updates and, and just to clarify on that chief because uh, i know that that was part of the response but obviously one of the challenges that you pointed out is funding and you've made it clear uh, clearly you would need more funding right to, to do some some more robust training and that's something uh, i'm hoping you'll request of, of the council uh, or the city manager and, and then something that my colleagues will uh, hopefully support. But just to emphasize that that is that is one of the hurdles, correct, Chief? Thank you for the comments. Again, uh, council member, um, 
And just a point of clarification, uh, the, uh, the yellow items are things that um, need further analysis uh, for consideration for implementation. And yes, you're right. Um, we are gonna, we have to coordinate um, through the city's budget process as appropriate in, in the context of the city's overall uh, fiscal condition. Uh, so yes, uh, that's something that uh, we will factor into the analysis and uh, report back uh, to the Public Safety uh, Strategic Support Committee in the fall. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and yes, no, I, I think to be clear on, and I think you were clarifying that, but to be clear on what my, I think my uh, point was earlier was that none of the recommendations have you outright stated uh, you're in opposition to or that, that they cannot be implemented, which we do get at times in our audit responses. And, and that is not, I didn't see that with not one recommendation. There is the list of yellow recommendations that are gonna need, uh, number one, they can't be implemented potentially today or immediately, uh, or they're gonna need uh, further uh, evaluation um, before a, a recommendation is coming forward. But not one of them out of this entire list was being rejected. That is, that is a correct statement, right? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, I, I, there's a lot of work to, to be done. I mean, I think um, certainly, right, the, the, the laundry list of recommendations that we have in through our uh, uh, PISFIS committee, um, Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee that, that I chair, uh, we will be hearing continual updates on these implementations uh, or on the implementation of these recommendations and uh, further update. And then obviously, on the ones that are going to require uh, continued analysis or community input and feedback. Um, so this is the, you know, uh, I guess not the beginning, but the, the next phase, the beginning of this, the, the next phase, we, we have now had some really robust external analysis and internal review. Um, and now we have some recommendations and steps laid out for us to go out and, and continue to improve on our department. And, and uh, so again, I'll say I really appreciate uh, the analysis went into this and um, I'm pleased with the, the results and with the eight, um, the work that you've laid out for us as a city uh, and a police department um, and a community to to continue to improve policing here in San Jose. And so, uh, Mayor, are you looking for rec recommendation on both um, reports here? Yeah, we can take a motion to, to all the all the reports. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll so move in on on accepting um, uh, all the reports because I know that from both yes, our in, our independent police auditor and our chief as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks to uh, Chief Mata and our department, Siobhan and the IPA, and, and our um, outside evaluators at OIR and CNA for these detailed reports. I learned a lot, um, quite a few pages there. Um, I want to <laughs> run through <laughs> a few, um, just a few questions, hopefully pretty quickly here. And Chief, I'll just start with, with a couple for you. Um, you, you know, you called out the importance of community engagement and relationship building, which, which I know is something that you make a, a personal mission because I, I feel like I see you out there in the community constantly connecting with people. And I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, which themes like community engagement, uh, maybe measurement, what, what themes in, emerge from these reports that you see as the biggest opportunities to improve the way that we do policing and build trust in, in our community here? Sure, Council Member. Um, you know, as you read in those uh, numerous report, uh, pages of report, um, most of them are uh, opportunities for community engagement and community policing such as the survey, uh, satisfaction surveys, uh, uh, continued outreach, building upon what we already have done, uh, expanding those programs. Uh, and again, um, looking into uh, and working with our community to see what other programs or what other services we can uh, better provide or implement as part of this uh, new, new strategy. But um, definitely the input uh, for the community, uh, from the community is, um, is important. And I'll let um, also uh, Lieutenant Donahue, since uh, he's uh, read this uh, report uh, a lot more than, uh, than you and I have and, uh, and work with the um, consultants, uh, provide more detail. Thank you, Chief. Steve Donahue, Research and Development at the San Jose Police Department. So, um, Council Member, to answer your question, we've seen a lot of themes kind of rise to the top. Community engagement is the 
the primary one. It's going to be one of the ones that we jump on right away in our green area of our response. We've also seen training rise to the top. That's been a big issue. It came out in the OIR report from earlier. It's come out in the 21st century policing and the use of force reports. We've seen a lot of policy changes that would like to be seen by the community and those have risen to the top. So if you look at those three just individually, that's totally not comprehensive of all the reports, but generally speaking, if we change some policies, we have great community engagement and we do better training for the police department, you're gonna see some pretty significant changes. Thank you, and, and on the point of community engagement, are there things you, would, you, you wanna see us do differently, new strategies or tactics that you think are particularly promising? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, the, the biggest thing we'd like to see is a new community engagement consultant. And we're going to be asking the council for help getting a community engagement consultant to come in because our city is so diverse in every microcosm in each neighborhood and each community and culture in our city would like a different relationship with our department. It's not a matter of us coming forward and saying, hey, everybody, uh, coffee with a cop is the way we're going to do it. Maybe, you know, Boba with a cop was extremely successful with the Vietnamese community and we, we did that as a microcosm of one of the ways that we engage with the community. So having an engagement consultant come in, meet with our community, have those conversations at the intimate level and then bring it back to our department, that is gonna grow miles in helping us to develop a strategic plan on how to interact with the community as a department. Now on top of that, you've noticed that in the recommendations, there are recommendations for each division then to have a division specific community engagement plan. And to do that, we need that consultant to bring it down into the neighborhoods that are in that division. The same way the east side of San Jose is, it deals with the San Jose Police Department differently than the west side of San Jose, than the south side, right? So that's how we need to look at it through this lens of community engagement and partnership and a whole new way of doing that using the engagement partner. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, and then my next question is, obviously you have a lot of recommendations here and, and, and aspirations to implement all of them. I, I guess what I'd like to understand is as, the, as the, some of the leadership of the department here, how do, you, how do you implement recommendations when there's so many in a way that it doesn't just become a kind of perfunctory checklist of we've got to just, get through all these to check them off. I, I know that would not ever be the intention, but I just I personally looking at that list, it's a little overwhelming. There's a lot on your plate. How do you, how do you go about implementing these in a way that actually is embraced by the force and is, is good for the culture and, and actually makes people happier to come to work, not feeling like they're just being drowned in you know, hundreds of things they've got and now you know, boxes they have to check, if that makes sense. Sure, Council Member. Um, again, uh, that this all goes to the uh, the plan that we're going to roll out. Whether it be well, one is the strategic plan, and also the uh, community engagement, community policing plan. And that's why we took the approach of uh, highlighting them in the colors, much like we do here at, at Council, where um, you know some of these items. What can we do now uh, within the uh, current workload and budget, and what should we continue doing? And then uh, the other ones are, you know, what can we do in the future, right? Uh, given um, what I mentioned in terms of uh, budget, staffing, workload. Uh, and then, you know, the final items are, you know, working with uh, the outside agencies uh, to make those. So we have to take it uh, one step at a time and um, move forward with, uh, as has been mentioned uh, in the reports, uh, taking advantage of the low hanging fruit and, uh, you know, going from there. Did anybody else want to add anything or should we keep going? Okay, I don't envy you. I guess what I'm saying is it's a very long list and having done some change management in, in my career, I can imagine it's a little daunting. I mean, do you feel that there is real buy-in to do it in a way it doesn't just feel like a, a long list of things that have to be checked off? I saw, was it Lee Wilcox wanted to hop in? Yeah, I was actually hoping the AV team could throw up the staff presentation for this slide. So we could walk through that. Thank you. I, you know, I, I think 
um, and I'm going to hand it over to Lieutenant Donahue. I think one of the things that we thought through specifically with 4.2, you're, you're right, it's an exhausted list of very important recommendations. There's a lot of overlap with existing workload within the department that the chief, assistant chief, and, and all the deputy chiefs are leading right now. And we know that we've got a host, can you go to slide two? A host of um, recommendations also coming from the community around reimagining. And so by yellow lighting a lot of that work, it's, it gives us the ability, city manager's office, police department, other associated uh, departments that are involved as well as the community to work together to really prioritize those council member and, and hear from you guys when we come forward to PISFIS and in other forums are what are the three or four objectives that you guys are trying to achieve and what is the community trying to achieve so then we can prioritize all of those recommendations so that we're not just looking at a list of two or 300, but really be super focused about meeting the objectives that you and the community set for the organization. Yeah, great, that makes sense. And then just on the point of measurement, how do we help, and certainly hard enough for us being you know, paid to do this full time, very hard for the community to understand where we're going and how we're measuring our progress. Do, do we have thoughts on how we're gonna keep the community up to date on what we are prioritizing and our progress toward those objectives over time? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your question. So let's talk numbers a little bit. What we're looking at today, when we look at just the 21st century policing and the use of force report from CNA, that's 188 recommendations. Then we add on to it the 32 from OIR, right? And that's just today. Beyond that, we have prior existing items. We have the city auditor that pr provides us recommendations where we have open audit recommendations. We have outstanding recommendations from the IPA, those from the UTEP traffic and pedestrian stop study. And as you can see from this graphic, everything above those bottom two, we've already received. Now, when you look at the bottom two, this is the charter review and the reimagining public safety community advisory committee they're going to bring us things that are recommendations for our department as well. So right now we have 326 <laughs> recommendations pending, right? roughly. These are all open. These are not ones that we've completed, right? And so that <laughs> That's is- That's why a, I ask. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an incredible number, uh, but we have a plan. So our plan is this, <laughs> we, we are, <laughs> we're not gonna work on them one by one, right? <laughs> We're gonna group them into categories, into groups that we can implement. When we look at redoing our policies on protests, for example, we're gonna do them all at once. We're not gonna do them one at a time and beat the officers with a hammer on their head for each thing, right? We are gonna change the context. We're gonna change the, the paradigm. And so when we do these things, you're gonna find the buy-in through the change manage management in our organization, the communication that we have now. We've developed some incredible, um, organizational standards where we communicate with the officers in larger groups we have kind of town hall like meetings things like that and it allows us the opportunity to have input from them as well as provide them you know a voice and the opportunity to understand where we're going with this and the why behind it yeah so having said all that you're going to find us coming back to council in the fall and probably every fall thereafter with, hey, these are the recommendations that are pending. This is what we were able to accomplish in the last whatever that period is. And this is what we've moved into the green and why. These are the things that are still pending and why. And um, it's gonna give us that opportunity then to take a deeper dive into the items in yellow and try to execute some of those items in green and get them off the table for now. Great, thank you. I, I really appreciate that more that detailed response, and that makes sense to me. And I see that I'm at time, so I'll I'll save my other questions. Thanks, Mayor. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I saw <clears throat> going back to oh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Um, I didn't expect to be next. Thank you for the three reports from the uh, auditors and also Siobhan, your uh, analysis and Chief Mata. I appreciate all of the work that went into this and I also appreciate all of the recommendations and the scope of work that that will involve. Um, I have a lot of questions, I'm not gonna ask them all because I, I think you've covered a lot of them, but one thing uh, that was brought to our attention is 
the uh, training that is called out for in the incident command system so that you can train your officers or lieutenants and and uh, higher ups better or more efficiently or quicker and the recommendation or what you're suggesting is doing an online training and and that it will cost more money to do in person. I would strongly encourage you not to go that route. I would strongly encourage you to look at in-person training because I think that's more effective and it's more impactful to, to be able to have your officers go through real, real live examples or situations is much more helpful than being online. I've taken a lot of online classes and you're only half paying attention and not really able to, uh, to absorb the information and I'm not dealing with anything that is life or death like your officers are. So I would highly encourage you to do that. My question is, and I know there's a budgetary item attached and it's possible we're, we're in budget season or we're heading into that, that that's an option. But have you looked into grants? Have you talked to anyone who might be able to fund that as a way to uh, enhance our 21st century policing? Uh, that's something that we'll also, uh, through the budget process, uh, be um, looking at as well, as a source of funding. Through, so you'll be grants. looking at source of funds, not just through the general correct. fund? That's correct. Is that what you're saying? We'll okay. see if there's anything available for that matches this type of training for 21st century policing. Okay. And you have someone on your staff, or the city does, who can investigate these types of grants? And we do. Because it seems to me there might be a lot of money out there for people or organizations, foundations who want to help be change agents for police departments in this country. Right, we have a staff uh, that's with the department that looks into that and uh, you know, like any grants when we apply for them, sometimes we get them, sometimes we don't, but uh, we are definitely gonna try. Okay, great. And bef before I, I proceed, you know, we were around when those protests were occurring and uh, and, all, and what was happening, and it was, uh, it was, from my perspective, I just watched it on TV, it was horrible, it was painful to watch, uh, I know there were a lot of lessons learned and people were hurt, innocent people, but I know there were also bad guys out there too, so I appreciate the difficulty in the, in your officer's role in having to deal with bad guys who were robbing and starting fires and doing other things uh, and protecting the peaceful protesters. And I think that's really critical is that we learn how to protect the peaceful protesters and deal with the criminals who are out there. And that was the, that was the balance. But moving forward, I'm really glad to see these reports. Uh, I'm glad to see the after action report and the use of force report. I know there's a lot of recommendations and I know there's more to come with the charter review and the reimagining public safety. So I'm a little concerned about how all of the good recommendations and, and you, Chief, you haven't said, we're not gonna do any of them. You're, you're concerned about, and not to put words in your mouth, but concerned about how you will get it all done within the budgetary process and with, within the time. So is there a strategy? I mean, I, am, I picture this huge spreadsheet on how you're going to be able to identify all of the different categories from the three different reports and then the two others that are yet to come, the Charter Commission and, and the uh, Advisory Committee, how are you gonna meld them all together? Because many of them say the same things. Many of them are about more training for officers. Also there's, uh, men which includes mental health training and also the wellness, physical wellness of your officers and the mental health wellness uh, of your officers is, is important. And then there's the com community piece, which I see is the biggest piece. That's the piece where you, will get, get, regain the trust of the community. And I would, I would say that the majority of the people actually trust the police department. I certainly trust the police department. But as a result of the protests, and we saw some of the statistics, there's a lot of distrust out there too. So which of the, 
top efforts can you implement quickly to be most impactful to regain trust with the community? Sure, and uh, we are having a running spreadsheet that which uh, Lieutenant Donahue is maintaining uh, and as he, he just uh, described is uh, we're looking at all the uh, commonalities uh, amongst uh, these recommendations and to see which ones we can fit in uh, under the current uh, budget and, and, and uh, work plan. Um, and yes, it is very important. Uh, I think they all are important to the community because that's why we're here. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, as we uh, chip away at these, um, again, we'll, we'll continue to building on, on that trust within our community. Uh, but um, it's gonna take some time. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, we're two years uh, in, into this uh, since the incidents happened. Uh, so again, we're uh, looking forward to, uh, again, working um, the best we can uh, to uh, implement and start these recommendations. Thank you, that doesn't quite answer my question. Mm -hmm. Is there one thing that you think we can implement quickly with low cost that will show, uh, that will begin establishing trust with our community? What do you think that might be? And I'll let Steve Donahue uh, Siobhan has that a because, comment. Uh, <laughs> he has a spreadsheet. <laughs> Who's gonna? <laughs> Did you wanna talk first, sir? Thank you for the question, council member. Um, the CNA 21st Century Policing Report, Appendix C, has their assessment of what would be uh, high priority and low cost. Um, now, this is just CNA's um, suggestions, and I don't believe the department has weighed in with, with their assessment of cost and uh, value. But, I, you know, if you're asking me, there is one thing that I think should be looked at right away, which I think would improve community police relations, and that's recommendation 2.11.1, which would require officers to proactively identify themselves and the reason for the stop. They currently don't do that, and it does cause consternation among the public. I was interviewing some people from my office just this week who were surprised that officers were not doing that. We're not proactively identifying themselves um, and the reasons for the stop. And this is important for two things. Number one, um, people are reluctant to ask officers for a name and badge number. Um, they might be, you know, adrenaline's flowing and they're, they're worried and they don't want to be um, proactively asking or they worry that there'll be ramifications if they do. And the second thing is, if there's any gonna be any kind of request for consent to search, it'd be nice to know what the reason for the stop is. So if you're stopped for your back taillight being out and the officer wants to search your interior of your car, it may give you m more informed reasons to, to decide whether or not to um, provide consent or to not provide consent. So of, of, of all those on the CNA list that's high priority, low cost, I think that's the one I would like to move forward. Thank you, that seems like low hanging fruit. That seems like something you could implement quickly. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, I don't disagree with uh, the IPA. Um, however, I think for our department, one of the biggest, um, most important things that we're looking at is about community engagement. I think I'm sorry, is the what? Is about community oh, okay. engagement. The best way to engage the community is to engage the community. Right. Right. You have um, recommendation 2.1.3 says create a comprehensive community engagement plan, right? We don't have one. Mm -hmm. We have engagement plans, but it's not comprehensive. It's not universal. And I think we need that. And so that's actually greenlit. It's in our, we're jumping on it right now. And it's not low hanging fruit. Right. That's one thing I wanna recognize is that some of these are, there are some things that we can just implement because it's a policy change and we can write it real quickly and tell the officers how to do their job slightly differently. But that's not what this is. This is gonna be time intensive. It's going to be, um, it's gonna have a fiscal cost to it, but it's the most important thing that we can do because it's about our community engagement. So when you talk about redeveloping that relationship, that's what we need. And so that's the most important thing, I think. 
Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and my time's done, but, but I'm going to finish up by not asking a question and just thanking um, someone. Last week I had office hours and it was on the, I do a Zoom office hours every two weeks and last week it happened to be on these three reports. And uh, knowing that it was not in my wheelhouse to be able to answer these questions, I asked our new captain, Captain Brian Matchett, to participate, which he did. And he, uh, there, there were about 40 people in attendance on my Zoom, and they had tough questions for him. And so the, there's a lot of, I, I bring that up first to thank him for being available and participating in that and answering the questions where I didn't have to attempt to answer the questions, but also just being available. And it shows the thirst out there for the information. It's been two years, so there were a lot of questions about what happened with X, Y, Z. And you know we were able to answer some and not able to answer others. So I really appreciate the accessibility of your uh, captains to the districts and to help us out wherever wherever we need it, but uh, getting a good community engagement plan is really, really important, uh, and, and I would encourage you to move forward as quickly as possible with that. So thank you. That concludes me for now. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sparza. Um, and the consultants and the different departments um, that worked really hard on these reports. And while some of this work was already underway, I think that uh, we all see the need to ensure that uh, innovations to our policing are fully implemented and that other elements of our police department are fully evaluated. Um, so in regards to the use of force report, I think we can see some serious updates and improvements that are needed, many of which are currently underway, but I, uh, I just wanted to say that I think continuing these efforts ensures that the police department is um, achieving its goal of treating people with dignity, fairness, and respect. And to that end, I also wanted to thank Chief Mata for his commitment to ensuring that this work continues um, and for taking a community-driven approach to evaluating this, as he does in all things. Um, and and, and that the chief has instilled this vision and culture in the department and that the chief has surrounded himself with leadership um, that brings these values and share the vision. So I just wanted to say that um, because the chief and many folks have come out to my district and talked to residents of District 7 who um, who had a lot, have a lot of concerns, concerns about crime, concerns about fairness, um, and, uh, and that's been really important. And so with that said, um, I actually wanted to agree with the other comments um, that systematic changes uh, take time and commitment and resources. And I'm encouraged that while many of these recommendations are going to be implemented uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and I think uh, Council Member Peral has mentioned that the remaining recommendations um, will be coming back to PISFIS in fall. But I wanted to add my voice to the fact that uh, the budget and resources needed to implement many of these re recommendations um, haven't been addressed. and hopefully will be addressed as we go through the budget process. We've seen the need for staffing. We've seen the need for training. We've seen the need for more community engagement. And I wanted to add one thing that staffing's needed for training and, and all the other things that are mentioned in the report. But you know, one of the first things to go in the recession was community policing. And I think that that's, work that needs to be resourced to move forward. And we have often said that we're the lightest staffed police department for any major city in the United States. But at the same time, it, it's this is the price that we're paying. Um, and so as part of the evaluation of the remaining recommendations, 
Will these additional resources be included when it comes back to PISFAS in fall? And I don't know if that's a question for uh, the city manager's office. Good afternoon, Council Member Sparza. Um, I think that as part of the analysis that the police department will be doing will indeed entail if there's budget needs related to the, the next items going forward. And it depends on how much progress they're making on the existing green light lighted items. I think as we know, as we go forward with this budget process, you know, if there's immediate needs that we can afford in this budget, we will certainly look at that uh, based on, you know, council direction. Uh, as well, but they, you know, we can all also bring some things forward as well. So I think it's a combination of, you know, maybe some things in this budget, but also in future budgets as we go forward based on the capacity of the police department to implement the items. So, so very important. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, I also engagement is critical and, um, and I think I've said this before that we need residents of neighborhoods throughout the city to come together and um, and be able to be part of that process. Um, and I just wanted to make that point again that uh, we engage the city's residents. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I had, oh, I'm sorry, hey, Council Member Prost? Yeah, thank you, just wanted to follow up on um, uh, Siobhan had Ed. Um, so, and, and, and I finally bring this up because you mentioned Siobhan as you felt sort of a, a key item that could be implemented quickly. Um, and, and I would agree with you, this is in regards to the two, uh, 2.11. And uh, I know personally when, when I was on patrol, I would uh, regularly carry business cards and, and hand them out, um, you know, uh, pretty regularly myself as well. And, um, and that wasn't a very, you know, high high hurdle uh, to, to do so. But I know that we had something, uh, a pilot, and I wanted to hear both from Siobhan and Chief in regards to getting something back. Uh, the pilot was called uh, My90, and My90 uh, was uh, an opportunity for officers and the community to engage, but to, to engage sort of after an incident. Um, uh, every officer that, that went out and engaged with the community, this was piloted down in South San Jose, um, would would give a I believe it was like a business card um, but an info of the you know my 90 app um, and it was a, a text number I believe but it could have been an app or text but uh, it, it allowed community members to then provide feedback based on the stop that they or the interaction that they had with an officer and um, there was great you know obviously feedback from that for both the officers and the community and, and just being able to engage um, but it was a it was a requirement right after each stop that, that right. the officers were providing this info about right who they were their badge and then and more importantly follow up a follow up opportunity for the community to uh, respond to and provide feedback on their interaction. Uh, so I'll, first, Siobhan, what is your? I'm, I'm assuming you you recall that. Um, what was your thought on something like that? Is that uh, that's obviously more robust than just that recommendation 2.11. But would you be supportive of something like that um, returning as well, more permanently? Council Member Perales, my, um, my belief or my uh, recollection of the My90 program was basically in two parts. One was a three month study done in the Hoffman Viamonte area. And then the other was the police department engaging My90 when they were doing um, large events such as um, meeting with San Jose State University football players. So I am not aware of the My90 study you are referring to, um, but perhaps I could touch base. It's, it's the Hoffman, the Hoffman one. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, the Hoffman, as, as far as I recall, was um, it was a three-stage approach where officers would come in and and, and distribute cards and distribute other services. They would, they would basically enhance the services in the area to see if there was a positive response to, uh, to greater services. Um, I believe overall the responses were very positive, but I don't think it was uh, at the micro level of the interaction I had with the officer today or last week. 
that's my memory of it. I wasn't involved in the study, so perhaps the department would have more detail on that. Uh, um, and that's fine. That may not be the, you know, that may not be the, the route to, to go back to. Um, and like I said, it's more robust than, than simply what 2.11 states. So I'll, I will turn it over to the, to the chief or the police department, whoever wants to respond in regards to um, what your thought was on my 90. And uh, we did a pilot, obviously we didn't implement that, um, but some level of even deeper engagement with community members that we interact with. So not only the recommendations in 2.11 where you where an officer will provide their name rank and maybe their business card but also something that would include feedback a feedback um loop right where people can provide that feedback and we can learn from those interactions um so what is your thought on on that and then if you want to expand maybe why why would we not implement something like this rather quickly it, it is seemingly low-hanging fruit Thank you, Council Member. Uh, again, uh, much like uh, the IP, I'm not aware of the My, uh, My 90 pilot. Uh, I've heard that it's been used uh, with the prior administration. However, uh, again, my commitment to uh, the community and community engagement and providing better services is to, and currently we're working on developing a customer satisfaction survey. Uh, so each contact that uh, we make is associated to a case number and they can provide uh, their feedback. And that's in the works right now. Um, I can't, um, we're discussing and putting it together. Uh, we should have something um, in the next uh, month or so in terms of um, what that all entails. But that, that's something that I've been working on for the last, uh, along with the assistant chief for the last uh, several months. In line with exactly what I, I, I understood my 90 at least to be down in Hoffman via Monte, uh, and that would be, I think, valuable. Uh, so the second part, just in regards to 2.11, what, what is the hesitancy on implementing a policy like that? We we're working out on all the details, uh, council member, to see how that would look like. Um, my my vision or what how I, how I'm envisioning it is every contact, uh, we give out a uh, card much like we do the report receipt uh, with a QR code uh, and they can provide the, the feedback that way. That's my initial thoughts, but obviously there's more work to be done and more details that need to be worked on before we bring a policy like that forward. Having that conversation, obviously all the other recommendations that are coming forward to, um, to FIS FIS committee and uh, I'll, I'll end it on the point that Council Member Esparza had made in regards to the community policing. Um, prior to the recession, the Great Recession, um, and the, the the drop, the significant drop in staffing that we had here, um, I was a part of a lot of that community policing. I used to participate in the Camp Every Town program, and uh, we did away with officers being able to participate in that, uh, sponsored by the police department. During the recession, I still participated, and I did so on my own time. Uh, had to take vacation to to go and participate in a community policing event like that for a week. Um, and that's an opportunity that San Jose PD has not, uh, right, they, they haven't been able to participate in this past decade in the way that we did previously um, in uh, throughout the 2000s. And uh, programs like, that's just one example, but programs like that and that level of community uh, policing truly makes some, uh, you know, uh, just profound impacts for years and years to come. There are students that um, did that program and, and were students in the program when I was there for a number of years as an officer that still are in communication with me today because of that profound impact that they had through that program for a week. Um, and, and really there's a deeper understanding both on both sides of, of community members. These are youth, all high school youth that get a better understanding of police officers uh, and, and policing. And then the police officers that participate get a better understanding as well of the youth in our community. Um, and so I, I, you know, I would echo that um, you know, it is truly, truly important that we are emphasizing um, our officers getting out there with our community um, and, and being able to engage in ways like that again, um, whether it's with programs like that or in other ways. And I look forward to that, um, that work coming back as well on that plan, that, that community policing plan and how we're actually gonna, gonna make that more robust. Uh, so but thanks again. Thank you. Uh, I just want to 
emphasize some overarching things I saw in the reports here. <clears throat> As I looked at the OIR report, <clears throat> what I saw was <clears throat> the ongoing observation the department got better on successive days. <clears throat> By that, I mean in deployment of on-the-ground supervision, in reducing the span of control, in uh, letting go of the skirmish line, instead uh, uh, stationing officers outside of an area where they'd be more likely the, the, the target of uh, some, some protesters who might have not had the best of intentions. We know the overwhelming majority were quite peaceful, but we know there were, there were those who were throwing bottles and other objects. You know, in, in all those cases, in, in each day we learned, it seems. And I, I think that's really important uh, because I think it gets missed an awful lot in the headlines. Uh, you know, Councilmember Perales pointed out that the chief has really accepted the recommendations overwhelmingly here. Uh, I think if you look at many of the findings in these reports, I look, for example, at the use of force report, where I would expect to see many, many critical uh, observations. And, you know, we saw our findings like finding 34 of the San Jose PD's pattern of types of force used generally fits the pattern of an agency that uses appropriate force escalation procedures. And, and this is a department that has actively sought independent analysis of its practices uh, for many years. Uh, going back to the detention study, uh, it was done back in, what, 15 or 16, the University of Texas study on the use of force and race, uh, posting the use of force on a dashboard. And, and so, you know, look, the headlines are always the San Jose PD is not perfect. And, and we understand where the failures, you know, we see the failures uh, because in a big city, big city departments uh, make mistakes and those failures are very visible for all to see. But, you know, the chief began his comments today with an admission of harm that was inflicted on the community by, uh, by some who made mistakes uh, in those days back in, in late May and early June of 2020. And fundamentally, I believe this is an organization that is a healthy organization. Uh, our officers learn from their failures. We're transparent about our, our mistakes. Uh, we use data to identify trends to, that require correction and training. And we've got leadership that's committed to better training and ensuring that there's learning and that there's a culture uh, that is embraced by the rank and file. Uh, and so I, I just think that, you know, after having read these reports, I expected sort of a chorus of Eeyore about all that was wrong and ails our department. And look, we've got 300 and some odd recommendations now to go work on. Uh, there's no question there's plenty to, to pick at here in any big city department, but uh, what I see overwhelmingly is a very positive picture, and I think that's important uh, because I know it doesn't ever make the headlines, but people need to understand that they do have a department of women and men who are deeply committed to, to serving them and to doing better. Um, I want to raise a few questions uh, about the reports, and I guess going back to the one I just started with, Councilmember Mahan about priorities. And you got hundreds of these recommendations. I, I'm guessing that you're not going to implement all of them within the terms of service of everybody on this council. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I can't help but say, think that, you know, for all the discussion about how you're going to bunch some of them together and, you know, change the paradigm, hey, look, that's all important. But couldn't we come up with a top five or top 10? Uh, and, you know, when you come back in the fall so that we know exactly what your priorities are. And I say that not because I want you to pick the top 10 that are the low hanging fruit. I want you to pick the top 10 that are the most important to improving how we serve this community. Uh, because I, I know that there's some that are gonna require resources. There are some that are gonna require more collaboration and whatever it might be. But if they're the most important, then let's, let's start with the ones that are the most important and not just the ones that are low hanging fruit. And so I guess I'd ask, I, I know you're coming back in the fall, but can we see transparently, transparently in the fall, hey, here's what we've decided among this very large body of work, what we're prioritizing this year. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're not gonna get other things done too, but at least we'll know what that top 10, top five, whatever is. Does that seem reasonable, Chief? Yes, it does. Uh, thank you. We can work on that. Uh, appreciate that. 
Um, so now let me pick on one small, one little item, of course, among the many. In, in, in recommendation 6.1 of uh, uh, the use of force report, I thought it was a really important recommendation because I was surprised to see that there was no affirmative duty to de-escalate in the duty manual. Now we trained de-escalation. We, we sub, every officer is subjected to six hours of training. We talk about it. It's acknowledged as important, but it's not in the duty manual. And it wasn't put anywhere in those first couple categories of things to be done. It was actually put way at the bottom in the future. And that strikes me as being a really, really important item if what we're trying to do is set a clear tone and culture about the importance of de-escalation. So could you help me understand, Chief, why that item was put into future implementation and not into the immediate implementation pile? <laughs> sure, Mayor. Uh, like I mentioned in my comments is uh, we provided the input uh, as part of these recommendations, and I think that was one of them that um, we believe uh, wasn't updated uh, or corrected. And I'll let um, Assistant Chief Joseph uh, discuss that. Yeah, Mayor Licardo, uh, Paul Joseph, Assistant Chief of Police. So while there isn't a specific duty manual section for an affirmative duty to de-escalate, there is a tactical conduct policy duty manual section, and every use of force and every police action has to follow that policy, and part of that policy is de-escalation, along with a lot of other things. And so while there isn't a standalone policy, de-escalation is a part of our duty manual and a part of what we expect our officers to do. I mean, that, that all makes sense. So then why wouldn't we put that into the immediate implementation uh, category? I mean, it's, it's something we, got, we could take a look at. We could take it, you know, in, it would be somewhat redundant, but it could be a standalone to the uh, tactical conduct policy, which already contains that. Okay. But certainly something we can, you know. Okay. You're right. That's, that's not a hard thing to do. I, you know, forgive my ignorance. I, I mean, I haven't read the whole duty manual. I know it's really big, but I didn't know you had another duty manual in addition to the duty manual. Is it is a tactical duty manual or is no, it? No, no, oh. there is a policy entitled tactical conduct. I got which it. Is, which is one of our duty manual sections and it's in the use of force, uh, you know, area. Oh, I see. Manual. And, and, what, and it describes a number of things that officers are required to do in any encounter with somebody. Yeah. And, and de-escalation is a part of that. And it talks about time and distance and slowing things down and being okay. able to make better decisions. And that's, I mean, de-escalation is sort of a, a, a vague concept, if you will, and there's no guarantee that you're gonna try X, Y, and Z and you're gonna get a perfect outcome that doesn't result in any use of force. Right. But we do expect our officers to use appropriate tactical conduct and part of that tactical conduct includes attempts at de-escalation. Okay, uh, I think I get it. I apologize if yeah. my, my explanation wasn't clear. Yeah, no, no, your explanation was fine. Uh, it, I, um, it's, it, it sounds like part of res our response might have been, hey, we got this, <laughs> you know, in terms of how we responded to that recommendation. But that's fine. It may just be a question of nuance. So um, in terms of the training costs, I know this is something that caught some media attention. and. You know, the recommendation was explicitly focused initially on lieutenants. Now, I understand in a happy world, we'd love to have sergeants well-trained in crowd control. Um, but obviously, we've got a lot of priorities in this department for funding, particularly in adding officers and so forth, given our, our very sparse numbers. Why wouldn't we just say, look, if it's a third of the cost just to train lieutenants, why not just start there? Sure, Mayor, a good question. And um, as was documented in, in the uh, response, is that throughout the uh, report, um, they also mentioned uh, supervisory roles. And um, also, when these incidents occur, the sergeants are the first ones at the scene as they're waiting for the lieutenants to respond. So we found it beneficial for the sergeants also to be trained in this. But yes, we can definitely start with the lieutenants. Uh, first, uh, and um, and then move on with the sergeants. But in our recommendation, um, in our experience, uh, they both need to be trained in uh, in this topic. And also, um, as you see on, on page four, uh, they both require different um, hours uh, of training as well. Yeah. 
Okay, I look forward to talking more offline about that. Um, and then finally, I know this is a, a particular concern of mine, uh, which is around the projectiles and deployment of uh, projectile impact weapons. You know, we've got somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen injuries, at least based on lawsuits that have been filed in the city. Um, you know, we know we've seen visible evidence of the harm of these, these weapons uh, in our own city. I, I, I had a chance to see some of the changes to duty manuals in the past. As I understand it, we actually, back in 2017, we only allowed the use of 37 millimeter projectile impact weapons for crowd control, uh, stun bag shotguns and 40 millimeter projectile impact weapons were generally prohibited um, as a method of crowd dispersal. And, and then that changed in 2020, and much to my chagrin. Um, and I understand you've been looking at this, and I, I understand the response that was submitted by the department to the recommendations of, of the consultant. But I'm just wondering if, if, if we believe that these tools back in 2017 were probably not particularly safe or helpful in a crowd back in 2017. And we've learned what we learned in 2020. Why don't we just go back to 2017? And, and I guess just to clarify, for those who don't know, that there's, I believe the 37 millimeter tools were actually the ones that had five different batons attached, is that right? So that presumably it was significantly less impactful, I believe, because they were dispersed than the 40 millimeter. And so I'm just wondering, why are we still clinging to this, this tool? Sure, prior to uh, the 2020, uh, these, um impact weapons were not for uh, crowd management. And um, as we obtained some of these uh, different tools, we've you know, added to the duty manual and these policies. Come um, tw uh, the summer or May of 2020, um, we've, we felt that um, these changes would need to be made to, to be used. Uh, and that's uh, what the prior administration and um, we also made some changes back to the way it was. Um, and I can let uh, Steve Donahue speak about uh, the specifics in terms of how they were used and when they were changed. Uh, but that's the, the background uh, for that. Yeah. Lieutenant, did you want to? Thank you, sir. So um, as the chief mentioned, they, they had been used in, in the protests in 2020, but things changed pretty quickly. You notice that we, very quickly put out a, a duty manual change that summer that said you will not use them for the dispersal dispersion of a crowd. Okay, but I think what's most important is the major change that we did on December 31st of this last year, 2021. Assembly Bill uh, Assembly Bill 48 was signed into law in September of. 2021 by Governor Newsom, right. and that prohibited the use of any kinetic energy projectile impact weapons at protests unless it's under very specific circumstances. And those are listed in the bill itself and then again into the law that was written to support the bill. So we changed our department's policy completely surrounding all kinetic energy projectile impact weapons and chemical agents for use in crowd control. And we say that they're not allowed to be used unless, and there's a slew of criteria that have to be met in order for them to be used. But as a rule of thumb, you're basically looking that this is a violent subject creating harm against the officers or another person, and the use of that weapon is used directly at them, not to disperse a crowd, right. not for any curfew violations or anything like that, but only to stop the assault on someone. Yeah, and 
So I, I'm not discounting the importance of these weapons, for example, with a barricaded suspect, or I'm sure there are many circumstances where it's clearly a better alternative than a, than a gun. I'm just trying to understand if you're, if you're in a crowded scenario and officers don't have very good control over where this projectile is going to go because they do bounce and ricochet as they do, why would we want them used in a crowded scenario at all? Why not rely on other tools? Mayor, the, the limitations are pretty strict. We're not using them to move a crowd. If we're using them against, you know, th there's a lot of talk about you have a, a mostly peaceful crowd of protesters interspersed with a few who are violent towards us. Our options to get to those folks are pretty limited. If that tool can be used in a manner uh, where it's directed only at the person that's, you know, throwing objects at us or projectiles at us or something like that, um, with some distance and allows us to take that person into custody and not, you know, the other alternative is gassing the entire crowd, which then is affecting people who are simply peacefully protesting. So our options are somewhat limited, but, but I'll, I'll note as well, even prior to this change in the law at the end of 2021, we have policed numerous demonstrations, protests, and marches, and we haven't used these devices at all. So, I mean, the, the opportunities for us to use them are hopefully incredibly limited, and I assure you that, you know, we're going to follow not just the policy and the law, but the way to um, protect the rights of people to demonstrate in the city. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, just, just to add to that, uh, our policy also restricts, uh, if it's in a crowded situation, it has to be more specific, so, you know, they can't be randomly firing into a crowd. So right. our, our policy limits, uh, as uh, the Assistant Chief mentioned, to a specific instances where we can use it. No, I appreciate that. I, I, I can't help but think it's going to be very difficult to distinguish when there is, obviously, even if you have one person who is causing harm, you know, is the violent person in the crowd, and you're very focused on that one person. I, I just think this is, this is going to be problematic for us. Anyway, appreciate that the discussion, um, and I, I appreciate these are not easy problems either. Uh, okay, I think we have a motion from Councilmember Perales. I don't see any other hands, so let's go ahead and vote. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Uh, to the great disappointment I know of senior staff who have been waiting, uh, I think this would probably be a good moment for us to take a break. Uh, we want to do the sludge. All right, I'm, 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 all right. I've got a, I've got a mutiny on my hands. We're going forward. We're going to take on the next item, which is uh, item 6.1, approval of the amended and restated design build contract for the design and construction of digested sludge dewatering facility project, which. Everyone wants to discuss digested sludge right before dinner. There, there is food in the back if people want to go back and eat while we talk. Okay, we'll take a little break after this one, after we've had our sludge. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Appreciate you pushing through to get us in. <laughs> uh, Nat Fukuda, Assistant Director, Environmental Services Department. And I'm here with Mariana Chavez Vasquez, Deputy Director of the Capital Program at the Wastewater Facility. Alicia Alba, pr Principal Engineer in charge of the project. Simon Alder, our Consultant Program Manager, as well as Matt Kano, Public Works Director, and some of his staff are available as well if we have any questions. Uh, Mariana? Yes. So we'll go ahead, we'll try to go really quickly and make it as painless as possible. 
So just a little bit of a project history. This is one of our uh, big projects this year. It has been uh, in the planning since 2013 as part of the master plan for the facility. Uh, we have a long history uh, starting in 2015. We have come several times to council to present and get approval and recommendations on items related to the biosolids transition. Um, in 2019, uh, following a design build procurement process, we actually uh, brought to you the first part of a DB contract, a design build contract uh, with Walsh uh, Construction Services and Black and & Veatch as their engineer of record. Um, and then in 2021, uh, we came back again for an approval of the dewatering biosolids management strategy. Um, and uh, one thing that we wanna mention 2022, there is a new Senate Bill 1383 that took effect uh, that just started in January this year, and that is uh, relevant. We'll talk about it later in the presentation. Um, a couple of, uh, it went too fast, sorry. The drivers for the dewatering facility. So just, just want to re, uh, remind everybody a little bit of, of the history. Uh, based on the plan, master plan, uh, there are several goals that we're trying to achieve with this project. Uh, the first and, and, and more important one is create flexibility to respond to regulatory changes uh, that are now governing the disposal of biosolids, as well as have uh, a lot more flexibility with the market changes that we're seeing as well. Uh, another one of our goals is to reduce odors in the community. Uh, this project and the master plan also incorporated the Milpitas guiding principles. And one of the, um, the projects that need to be completed for us to reach our other goals is the completion of this uh, biosolids transition. Uh, the third one is that we wanna also enable other land uses. Uh, part of the master plan was for us uh, to transition out of the current lagoons and be able to use that space for other land uses. Uh, just a little bit of a map to remind people of where we are in the facility. Uh, the current practice that we have, we have almost 750 acres of lagoons and drying beds where we treat uh, biosolids for four years before they are sent to the Newville landfill uh, next door to the facility. Uh, the future practice that we are envisioning is a mechanical dewatering facility. Uh, that will be just around 10 acres, so you can see the difference in area. Uh, and it will be located just across the street from our operational facility. There will be a change in the number of trucks, uh, and we are expecting that we are going to have an increase on number of trucks. Right now, we only do uh, trucking of biosolids a few months during the year. Uh, but the timing of processing will change from four years to basically a day. So just uh, a little bit of where we are with the design build contract, as mentioned, uh, we had brought an original contract in June 2019. That was a contract for the design build, mostly including uh, the preliminary phase that we call, which is mostly related to design activities. We also did a lot of the permitting, the subsurface investigation, and we also developed uh, with the design builder a design up to 60% that allows us to get into contract negotiations and also a guaranteed uh, maximum price. Uh, so what we're bringing to you today is the next step on this process is what we are calling the amended contract. Um, as part of these efforts, uh, we are bringing you a contract that is now a negotiated price and, is, and has all the final scope for the project. Uh, so what we're bringing to you today is a, the, a contract that includes all the rest of the um, construction and engineering services all the way to the uh, startup and commissioning. We also have developed at this point detailed testing requirements and guarantees for performance of equipment. We have also all the provisions for any future liquidated damages and buy down conditions if that uh, comes to be the case. And we have updated all the terms and conditions of the contract. So if we go ahead with this contract, we will be able to issue a notice to proceed in March, 2022. And uh, the project will be completed by 2025. As part of this contract also, the design builder will participate in the OSIP program, 
which is the owner control insurance program for the facility. So just a little bit of an overview on the location. Uh, for some of you that have been up to the site, this is the current operational area at the plant. Uh, the facilities will be located both in the operational area uh, with a transfer station to go from the digesters on the uh, left side you can see there. Uh, we'll have a new pump station and then a pipeline corridor that will go to a site across the street where the new dewatering site will be located. So just a little bit of a rendering. Uh, this is just like an architectural rendering of what we are envisioning for the final facility to look like. So again, uh, a dewatering building with all the equipment inside. Um, we also have the loading area for uh, loading biosolids and all the other control associated with this type of project. So um, just a couple more views. This will be the view from Sanka Road just to give you a sense of how the facility would look like. Uh, the equipment to be used, uh, these are what we call the watering centrifuges, and this is what will basically will do the job of the lagoons and the drying beds. So um, a few things that we want to mention about the, uh, the new contract that we're bringing to you. Uh, due to the complexity of the project, uh, CD staff work with the design builder in meetings and workshops over a period of three months to negotiate all the terms and conditions of the contract. We believe that the project that we're bringing to you today includes a very efficient design and it comes at a very competitive pricing. There are a few challenges that we would like to highlight just to kind of talk about some of the things that we're facing at the facility right now. Obviously, one of the, of the things that has been difficult is the market conditions uh, due to COVID and the supply chain uh, shortages that we're having that has affected our project. However, we have taken several steps for uh, ensure fa uh, fair pricing. Uh, one of the things that is important to note with design build projects is that the, the, the pricing becomes an open book by the design builder from the beginning. So there is a cost model that gets developed and we have access to the, um, the cost from the very beginning. So every decision that we make is informed with what the cost change would be. So we also uh, did a lot of value engineering just to make sure that we could manage our budget and try to keep the project to what we think would be a, a manageable size. We have also established, and this is a program-wide thing, uh, independent cost estimate reviews. So we do a lot of analysis to make sure that the pricing that we're getting is accurate and reflects the market conditions. Uh, and one of the things that was done as part of the design build work is that uh, all the, uh, the bidding for subcontractors and supplier packages, everything was competitively bid. So what we have right now is what the market returned and we believe we have like the best uh, price that we could get. Uh, the price in design build includes as well the contingency, the market escalation. And at the end of the day, we also negotiated uh, with the contractor design builder for a fixed price contract. So we managed to reduce the pricing uh, further down to an advantage to the city. And we also uh, negotiated competitive liquidated damages uh, and buy down provisions. Uh, so just this is more just like a show of how the pricing works and how it changes during the design build process. Uh, one of the things that you can achieve with this uh, type of model is that you have better control of the cost and also the allocation of the risk. So uh, when we do all the cost uh, modeling and all the negotiation, what you are seeing here is not just construction costs. It includes all the direct construction costs, but also all the engineering costs, the general conditions, the overhead and profit, contingencies, escalation. So this is truly a, a complete price. So what you can see here is that when we started with the project after we selected the design builder, we were at a budget of estimate of 137.2 million. Obviously, there is a lot of changes during the life of the project, but we are right now, what we're bringing it to you today is a final guarantee uh, negotiated fixed price of 132.2. So you can see that we have managed to actually come below what we thought even originally. And as I said, we believe it's a good uh, price what we have been negotiating with the design builder. Uh, just um, as a comparison that we wanna mention, uh, 
a lot of the projects that we're seeing in the Bay Area right now, they have really discrepancies what, what, uh, with what was the engineer's estimate and what the bids are coming at. So uh, East Bay Mod, just as, the, as an example, another one of our uh, Bay Area uh, agencies, they saw a difference in one of the latest projects they did. They had an engineer estimate of 210 million. It came back at 270. So the, that is happening all across the Bay Area. So I think we, we are very proud of the, of the work we have done with the design builder to be able to actually come under the budget that we originally had. And this also includes all the contingencies right now and all the COVID requirements that we have to this date. Uh, just a little bit that we show all the time, the, the project cost summary. So the construction cost for the project is 127.5. As mentioned, what we're bringing to you includes also a lot of the final design uh, preliminary services, services during construction. Uh, so all that is inclusive in the price of the project. And what we are coming for today is hopefully uh, for a recommendation for approval of the amended and restated design bill contract uh, for a fixed price of 131.161 million and uh, to ask for approval of a 10% construction contingency that will be held by the city and that will be just used for anything that could be outside of what the, ba the base fixed price is in accordance with the amended contract. And with that, we can answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm interested, is this item a part of kind of uh, the questions of sea level rise that we're, we're concerning about, concerning ourselves about, learning to be more concerned about? Um, I, I don't know if I heard that quite mentioned here. Uh, it should be, and uh, I know you don't want to be alarmist, but it kind of needs to be like mentioned to ourselves, like what are we we're facing in our communities at this time in the Bay Area? Good luck in these efforts. I, I think as San Jose, you've done some really interesting work about uh, natural disaster preparedness uh, for a community uh, within committee reports and, and public meetings, uh, you know, within committee report, uh, items that uh, you, 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 you offer ideas about natural disaster preparedness that is uh, unique for, for Bay Area cities, I feel. And uh, I think a good, a good model and example. And uh, just thank yourselves. Thank you very much for doing this. And this is a part of these efforts. And uh, I hope we can be very uh, open about talking about all the future of uh, natural disaster issues we have to prepare for. And that includes how we write our memos and, and, and how we plan accordingly for possibly 2023 and 24. Uh, if we talk about these ideas openly and honestly in our memos, now, I think it will set a good standard and make things easier to talk about in this upcoming year. So good luck how you can do that and, and to be honest with ourselves and prepare us well, whatever to expect, good or bad. Thanks a lot for this item. Call in user three. Man, after hearing all that, all that feel good stuff of what you guys are going to be doing for this city just gushing right now but when it comes to natural disasters what you guys need to do is look around the zoom call or the room wherever you're at and look to your left and look to your right and look straight ahead and the only natural disasters is san jose pd san jose fire department and of course the city council and the mayor that's a lot of natural disasters that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And you what could uh, opine on the actual topic today? Yeah, I'm keeping on topic. We're talking about natural disasters. You're one of them, Sam. Come on, buddy. Have a nice day. Come on. Back to council. All right, uh, back to council. Questions? I'll move to approve the contract. All right. Sorry to come up the works, but I did have a question, Mariana. Can we go back to that uh, slide where you describe all oh, the prices going up and down? I've seen this a couple of times, but I didn't fully understand it. I just want to make sure I, uh, you started at 137 million, I think.
So it's probably about 10 slides in. Um, I, I, the, first, uh, the first bar I saw was VE. Is that value engineering? Yeah, that reduced the cost considerably. And then we went through, it looked like, was it 30%? Is that 30% design? All right, so you guys don't arrive at anything until you get to 60%, is that right? Definitive uh, projects of middle. Uh, so at that point, we, we basically have a final design. All right, so everything was heading in a happy direction until we got to 60% design. Yes, and that is something that unfortunately happens during design. Uh, uh, we have a lot of um, stakeholders in a project. Can we go back to the slide, please? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanna, thank there you. There you go. So we have a lot of take, as you know, you may, we, we have a lot of uh, stakeholders in our projects, and one of them is our operations and maintenance staff as well. Uh, so our value engineering process uh, propose things that as an engineers we think we can, we will be okay to do without. Uh, that is not always a consensus with all of our different uh, areas, and some of that it has to do with uh, redundancy, reliability. Uh, preference for materials and all that. So we try to accommodate for that in projects because at the end of the day, uh, we need to be uh, mindful of how uh, the system will be operated. This happened in all our projects that yeah. we try to manage, but uh, it is a common occurrence. I don't know, Nap, if you wanna add to that. Yeah, I would say what uh, Mariana has also alluded to is when we get to that point, when we're also looking at types of equipment, whether it's we have tanks on site, certain pumps, we also start benchmarking against other facilities, similar facilities in the area to see what they're using, what their experience is. So even though the engineering design may present something at the, whatever, the VE or 30%, you know, we, we may re re look at it and work with our O&M team, talk to the O&M at our partner agencies and decide, well, you know, yes, it's doable, but our preference, and if we were within budget at that point, we were, we thought it would be most beneficial for us to, if you will, get maybe not the, the lower level piece of equipment, but step it up a little bit. Also add a, some redundancy, as she said as well too. It is a, it's a new operation for us. Yeah. So it's gonna be running 24 hours rather than the solar drying we do now, where it's pretty low tech. Right. This high tech thing, we wanna make sure that this thing is operating because the, the flow is continuing. So we added some redundancy as well. Yeah. Okay, the and then DPS, what's DPS? Uh, definite project submittal. So that's basically it. the final kind of offer. The final, that, that one includes all the actual bidding uh, packages completed, we have all the costs finalized. And that's what the design builder basically gives us. This is the cost that you will have for the project that you are asking for. Okay, this is a pretty uh, standard path for design build. Yes. Okay, great, thank you for all that. Uh, let's vote. Jimenez? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Jimenez. Sorry. <laughs> sorry to throw a wrench in My the bad. Class. You did. I just ignored it. <laughs> right, no. I, I knew that. I knew. <laughs> just, uh, j just a quick question, and part of this is just my ignorance, but so this plant is co-owned by Santa Clara and San Jose, right? And so, correct? And so is there, and, and again, just curious, is there a similar presentation that's given to the Santa Clara City Council and then we both approve the same thing and then it comes together? Or are we, remind me, are we sort of yes, a lead so agency, if you will? We do the presentation at the Treatment Plant Advisory Committee. So oh, representatives TPAC, right. of Santa Clara are there. And I saw the letter in the packet. Yes, that was, okay. and we also do the presentation. We have meetings with Santa Clara prior also and, and, and walk them through the presentation. But that's on a TPAC, it was on two weeks ago. The exact same presentation was given to them. Okay, all right, and I, okay, all right. And then the other question I had is there's, there's a lot going on at this facility. I, I had a tour sometime back, thank you very much. Found it fascinating, it was very cool to see all the stuff that we often talk about. The digester thickener facilities, those are uniquely different in a different project that's happening, right? Yes, that's a different project that is, uh, we're in the process of commissioning, that's in the main area of the right. treatment facility. And then, but that is still wash, Walsh is as, as the designer builder. Correct? No, they no. are the contractor. So oh. they, the digester and thickener is a regular design bid build. They are the general contractor for that. Oh, job. Okay, okay, all right, okay. So, so my question is this, and I guess maybe it'd be me to Matt, and, and I apologize, uh, Matt, that I put you on the spot, but I know recently there was an article 
another article <laughs> in the news. And so my question is very general in the sense that we, we, we see that there may be some existing issues or past issues as it relates to Walsh and their work in these other spaces. How do we make certain some of this stops happening in this new sort of phase, if you will? So let me, the, let me answer from my side and then yeah, I'll please, let, please, I'll please. let Matt, or you want to No, go ahead, start. Uh, so from quality issues and all that, we haven't seen that. Some of the issues that you may refer in Matt is better to answer because they're more labor related. Right. Uh, we have no issues with the quality of work from Walsh. They have actually uh, been a good contractor with us. Good. And the design build, uh, even when we selected them prior, it's a competitive process. We, we selected them on best value. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we are confident that we selected a good design builder and we have had no issues. Uh, again, I think that we have a really good design in our hands. So from our side, from the technical side perspective and quality of work, we have no concerns. I'll we're we're getting what we're paying for, yes. right? Yes. I'll let Matt answer. Yeah, the thanks, Mariana. Thanks. Matt Kano, Public Works Director. Thanks for the question, Council Member. Um, I, as I mentioned, the info memo that was released last week, um, Walsh has, this has been a very complicated, the digester and thickener, I would say that it's one of the, if not the most challenging construction CIP project the city has ever um, embarked on. And I'm, a lot of folks in this room are really happy. We're really close to completion. Um, Walsh has been a great partner on the project, as Mariana alluded to. Um, it's been a very difficult project that's had a lot of challenges, um, um, whether it's a seismic design challenges that we've settled with the designer of record on or PCB environmental challenges um, and other. It's, it's run into many, many challenges. Um, everybody's persevered. It's had well over 100 subcontractors. Um, there have been um, complaints we've received regarding the paperwork related to and other um, labor items related to, to a few of the welders. Um, and we have been investigating that. Um, one um, welder had an um, was welding without a license. As soon as Walsh found out about that, they removed them from the site. Um, and then the, um, there's a f um, some discrepancies in some workers' comp paperwork for two of the welders that we are looking into and we'll be referring to the state. Oh. Um, the welder, one of them had workers' comp um, the whole time. There's just, it appears, however, it looks like there's a discrepancy on the state paperwork because it shows as exempt. And we're still looking into the others because it's a more recent concern that we've received the past few weeks. Right. There is some training fund um, that, dollars that were supposed to be contributed by these companies to the state of California to go into the California's training fund. Um, that is not that does not go directly to our workers nor directly to the city of San Jose. It's about tr probably about $24,000 that we will be um, uh, informing the state so they can collect on that. And there's a couple thousand dollars of overtime pay that was incorrectly calculated for one of the companies. Um, we don't like we like perfect paperwork. We want, um, we want, and, and we really do invest, every, every concern, every complaint we do, we do investigate and we look into, um, especially when there's evidence provided of that. Um, sometimes we do receive um, generic complaints and concerns that are really hard to follow up on. Um, I don't want to belittle any um, issues on the site. Um, we take everyone seriously. We want, we want that perfection. However, the, some of these items, not the unlicensed contractor, and we're working through that with Walsh, and they've committed that it won't happen again. Um, but the other issues are things that are a little bit of a little more common occurrence, especially the, um, the miscalculation of overtime pay, some apprenticeship forms, and the training fund. Um, and we're following up on those. Um, okay. And we are still, yeah. So that's my quick explanation of that and be happy to provide any further so details. I, I appreciate that. I have every confidence that you and everyone in your department and folks at the wastewater treatment plant are looking out for the well-being and, and, the, and the, the taxpayer dollars, if you will, as we go down the, the road with some of these projects. I guess the things that come to mind, Matt, is, you know, we can only do what we can do. You have a limited staff and, and you know, oftentimes you're receiving some of these concerns and complaints and you have to be reactive at times, right? And so I think that for me, that just suggests then that Walsh needs to do a better job of making sure some of these folks like licensed welders uh, are working on their job. And so do you know, like, so, so they're actually going to be operating a little differently and sort of uh, having uh, more set of eyes on, on how they go through that process or? Absolutely. And Luke Lani from Walsh is here um, as well um, to represent them. 
we um, have had several discussions with Walsh, um, and and, and they, we have their commitment, and there's some changes that they've made to okay. their process for checking the licenses on the contractors on the okay. site that they've implemented to make sure this okay. doesn't happen again. Okay. Um, the issue with this contractor, it is someone they had worked with before on a prior site um, and had a great, good relationship with, from my understanding, and so there was a miss when this person tr moved into this project of not rechecking that. Yeah. But they have created systems um, that they've shared with us what those are, um, so that doesn't happen again. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and I would just say, the reason I ask these questions, even though you know it's a little uncomfortable for me to be asking, and I know we, we've talked about this in the past, it's just, I suspect none of us like to see the stuff that's in the media, and so to the extent we can do whatever we can to make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. I, that, I think that's all we desire, but I, I know you guys are working hard, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, any other questions? Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Esparza? Okay, marking absent. Okay. Uh, let's, um, let's take a break and return at 7 o'clock. And we'll, we have two more items left on the calendar. Thank you, everybody.